lot of the stuff I have is from, from NOAA uh, climate records um, and also a little bit from a, a, a 538 article, but the article uses all NOAA data too. So it just, I like some of the graphics of it. I'm gonna talk real quick. This is, this, Kenny has uh, done a lot of talks to, even to different watershed districts, as well as a, a number of conferences and things about how Minnesota's climate is changing. Uh, we are getting warmer and wetter over time. Um, a lot of the warming is being driven by a loss of cold in the uh, in all seasons, but specifically uh, nighttime winter temperatures. Um, I'll, I'll touch temperatures very briefly just because I think it is relevant, um, but we won't go too far into that. And then we'll talk about heavy rainfall becoming more frequent and more intense. Um, before I go any further, can you guys, everybody hear me okay? Is the uh, volume okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, just real quick, looking at temperatures, the average temperature uh, change in the state of Minnesota um, has been changing from, uh, from about one to two and a half degrees over the last hundred years or so. Um, that is particularly, if you look at the middle graphic uh, happening uh, in the winter time for low temperatures, we're just not getting as cold in the winter at night. Um, around four degrees in central Minnesota, almost five degrees in, in northern Minnesota. And then summer highs are a little bit less, but not quite as pronounced. Um, and then the only other temperature one I'm going to show is just a, a quick look at um, how the average temperature in the entire state has been changing over the last 125 years. Um, it's kind of about six degrees over, over that time period, uh, about a half a degree change per decade. It's pretty steady um, all the way through, but then you see it really jumping here. The last oh, 30 years or so, we've had nine of the top uh, 10 warmest years here in the state uh, have been during that time period, not nearly as many cold ones. We get one every now and then. 2014, of course, stands out. Um, but overall, you can just see temperatures have been rising throughout the state. Um, I'm going to jump into this one. I, I really like this uh, presentation that, uh, that Kenny put together. And this is a, a graph of the annual temperature in the state of Minnesota across the bottom. So the yearly, it, basically, the, the, the state climatology office calculates a single annual temperature for the state of Minnesota every year. Uh, and then they do the same thing for, for precipitation, and that is along the left axis here um, in, in inches. So over the time period, about 100 years from 1895 to 1986, the general average temperature was right about 40 degrees with about 26 inches of precipitation for the state of Minnesota, kind of representing the state. And you can see all the plots for each year kind of uh, surround that number. Now, if we add the last 30 years in there with the red squares, you can see that see a difference. Uh, and you, and you know, almost every one of the years of the last 30 years have been in the warmer and wetter category. Um, and then at least if it's not warmer and wetter, it's at least warmer or wetter. We only had one year that was not um, warmer or wetter in the last 30 years than normal uh, here in the state. So again, that's a very, very good evidence, solid evidence of how, how things have been changing um, around the state. So I did, this is a precipitation for, again, for the state of Minnesota, the uh, annual average precipitation for uh, about 125 years. Um, and the average for that entire time is about 26.14. Um, and then uh, each, each year is plotted along this line. But if we take a look at the average since 1980, so for the past 40 years or so, you can see that line has been uh, increasing at about 6 tenths of, a, of an inch per decade through that time period. If we look at the lower one down here and just look at the last 20 years, it's been rising at an inch and a half per decade. Um, so the, the rate of change is increasing over time as far as the, the amount of precipitation that we're seeing um, in Minnesota um, on a yearly basis. So uh, just ran a couple, and you kind of referred to this at the beginning, Mike, uh, uh, how much rain we've been seeing in Minnesota. This is the, the precipitation ranks. Um, for each year. So starting at 2014, we ranked, it was the 94th out of 120 years, or 94th highest. So again, in the top 20% uh, or so um, of precipitation in Minnesota in 2014. Pretty close to that again in 2015, uh, definitely wetter than normal. 2016, we were the second wettest year on record, uh, 121 out of 122. So only one year was, was wetter than that. Um, and again, most of the upper Midwest fell into that category. Again, wetter than normal in uh, 20, I didn't put the year on there, sorry, 2017. Um, uh, just, just to our uh, east, they had the, the wettest ever in Michigan. 
We got to 2018, we were pretty close to the top again, 109th. Uh, as you can see, uh, just nearby us again, Wisconsin and Iowa both had their second wettest years. And then last year, uh, we were the, the wettest year again ever in the history of Minnesota, same thing for all of our neighbors. Um, and so it just kind of shows over time, we've, we've just been staying above normal, above normal, above normal every, every year. And in the terms of uh, the two year precipitation record, so if you combine eight, 2018 and 2019 and compare it to any two year period, all of these sites set um, records for the, the wettest two year period in history from parts of the, the uh, Ohio Valley. And then of course, throughout the entire upper Mississippi Valley and much of the state of Minnesota, Iowa and Wisconsin. So um, let's look a little more local. This is the lower Minnesota watershed. It's hard to see on the map. But, uh, Minneapolis is up in here. We have Lakeville over here and then uh, lower Minnesota running down through here. Average annual precipitation in this basin is uh, ranges from about 29 and a half inches in the west side to about 33 and a half on the east side of the basin. And on the right side, we have a line graph of the precipitation for this basin. Uh, with the, the dark red line being the 30-year average, but as we can see, if we follow that uh, that red line, uh, we started off, you know, running average back in the, the 30s and 40s of about 27 inches for the basin, and by the time we get up to uh, last year, we're talking an average of about 32 inches of, of rainfall per year. So it's just getting wetter uh, on a pretty regular basis within this basin, not just uh, uh, statewide. Uh, the departure from the mean over time. Uh, this is looking at the last 30 years. Again, we've gone from one inch above normal of, of what we had been to about three and a half uh, the east side of the basin. And then this I thought was, was very interesting too, this lower part of the, the right-hand graph. Uh, each of these bars represents a 30-year period. And so it's the, the first 30-year period running up through about 1930, 30 to 60, uh, 60 to 90, and 90 to to 2020 here. And so as you can see almost every year as we start the spring, we are now running much wetter than we than we had been uh, in the earlier part of the century in April, same for May, same for June, same for July, same for August. We have another uh, spread here in October where we tend to be wetter than we, than we used to be. So each month um, we're seeing that. So it's not just a certain time of year, it's pretty much all summer long and even into the fall that we're seeing is uh, increased precipitation numbers. Could, could I, I'm sorry, pause you here. No, please do. Somebody have a question? I, I didn't, I'm not hearing you. I yeah, I, I don't hear it either. I, I don't Hello. Area like that. I think you're breaking up, unfortunately. Sounds like you're scuba diving. Can you can you hear me, Craig? I do now. Yes. Now, now we can. can you can't hear me. Uh, What's that? Shoot. No, we can hear you. So, Craig, could you please in that slide before this? Could you please? Awesome. Could you please share with us where the Prior Lake Spring Lake watershed is in that? Because that's a broader area. Where yeah, about it's, are it's we a little broader. Yeah, it's a little broader. I didn't I didn't have this data on a just a small watershed basis, unfortunately. It's it's right about in here. Or my yeah, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. Yes. Let me see if there's a Ooh, how's I can that? see it. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'll continue on. Yeah, if anybody has questions, please uh, feel free to interrupt and I'll be more than happy to stay for a while and, and discuss things at the end as well. All right, now I seem to have locked it up here. There we go. Sorry about that. Oh, great. Now, how do I get rid of that circle? Here it is. There we go. Okay, so um, you, I know you're uh, very concerned about uh, heavy rain events themselves, just the individual events. Well, uh, we've got this data from uh, uh, Department of Natural Resources 
uh, kind of showing the trend of two inch rainfall uh, events. So uh, starting from back from about 1920 through the- um, But Craig, that, sorry, can I pause you? Is this for the state of Minnesota or for- this, Yes. Sorry, this is for the state. This is using the 40 long-term precipitation stations over a 100 year period. Do you do you have this kind of data for our area or the lower min as you, that area? You know, just That's to something. be good with time here for my colleagues, I think we're very interested in this, but it's really mostly because I understand, right, that the patterns can be changing for a lot of different areas within the state of Minnesota. And so broader statewide data is probably less of interest. But I think specific data on our area, what you know, what we are expecting to deal with or potentially make investments would be very much of interest. Okay, yeah, I, I don't have that offhand. Um, most of the, the, the data that I'm able to find is on a larger scale. Um, okay. That is something I might be able to come up with, but I'd probably not until I'm back in the office. Okay, which um, that that's fine. This is, I think this would be important for us um, if you have that for our local area, because I think that was what the, the driving force was, Craig. So as yeah. we're potentially embarking on some significant investments, you know, what are the design standards that we need to deal with, um, you know, for our area? So I think that's what the interest is, not maybe um, as much so on the broader, sure. although the statewide sure. stuff is interesting, but maybe not as specifically relevant to us. Sure, sure. I do have a couple of charts uh, toward the end that are specific to our, to uh, they're based on MSP, but they were for a single point that is very close. Sure. I think, awesome. find that, I think you'll find that very interesting. So it, please do that. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Uh -huh, certainly. But anyway, I just this this is real quick. Um, just throughout the state, the number of two inch rainfall uh, storms that we have went from oh in the the, the teens to low twenties for most of uh, the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. To we're we're now seeing quite often at least 50 of those a year in the state. Um, as many as 76 in 2002. So. Um, the, the norm is certainly increasing from around the 20s to pretty close to 50 by now. Similarly, um, and this is something I've noticed and talked with a lot of my colleagues for about, and I've got some other ones that will show this too, is the number of, uh, the, the, our maximum rainfall event is so much higher than it used to be. Um, if you look back before 1960, we rarely had a single event anywhere in the state that was six inches or more. Um, and now we get that pretty much every year, and including it, we, we see every couple of years, we see a 10 inch rainfall amount in, in the state. And we just, as you can see, that never ever used to happen in the state of Minnesota. So that's part of, a, again, an evolving uh, a piece of climate change that we're seeing, uh, just more high end rainfall events in the state. Uh, and lost me. There we go. So this one's pretty, uh, th th there's a lot going on in this chart. And this one, again, it's, it's over the entire state, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. But basically what you can see is using the, the bar chart, um, the number of rainfall events, uh, that is a one inch rainfall event has gone from uh, less than normal frequency back in the 20s to now 20 to 25% more likely every year uh, anywhere in the state. And this, again, this, this line here shows that the maximum rainfall event in any 10 year period has gone from around five or six inches back in the 30s to 10 or 11 inches uh, these days. So this is the one I was talking about, Mike, here. This is the comparison of 100 year rainfall events from the old rainfall frequency atlas that was uh, uh, produced in the 60s to the most recent update, which was done in uh, 2013, just for our local area. So, um, the blue bar charts are what the, uh, the, the one hour, uh, 100, the 100 year event or the 1% storm for one hour used to be about three inches. Um, once we started adding some more data to that, that raised to about 3.75. Uh, if we look at the three hour event, it was about 3.75 for the uh, 100 year event. Now it's five and a half inches. Um, for, for 12 hours, it had been about you know, you, you'd expect a five inch rain every 100 years or so, now it's over seven. And so that just kind of shows how much that has changed locally um, in terms of design, I would think, when you're looking at, uh, you know, a 50 year or 100 year event. Yep. Yeah, and so then this one too, this compares 
um, what those 100 year events were for the one hour, the two hour, the three, the six, the 12, what the 100 year, what its recurrence interval is nowadays. So the one, the one year, yeah, excuse me, the one hour storm of three inches, which had been a 100 year event is now a 40 year event. Or again, if you take it in terms of percentage, you went from the 1% storm to about the two and a half percent storm. Um, the, the biggest difference is in the three hour. What used to be a 100 year event is now a 20 year event uh, from three hour rainfall of 3.75 inches. Uh, I think that's just the, the kind of the starkest look at how things are, are changing when you when you look at that, that, that three hour rain. Um, another good one is of course to look at uh, a 12 or a 24. What used to, if, if we used, used to take approximately 100 years to get a six hour, 24, uh, six inch, 24 hour event, that's now a 40 year event. Uh, again, we've, we've kind of tried to change those into percent storms versus the return period because it gets um, kind of lost in, in some of the data where people think if we get a storm like that, we won't see one for another 100 years. Obviously, that's not true. We can have them happen more often than not. This just yep. the, the chance of it occurring. I'm sure you guys completely understand that. So the last slide I have, and then we can just talk about anything, is uh, the state classifies the extreme rainfall or mega rain events as six inches or more of rain over a thousand square miles. So it's a pretty large storm. Um, and in the history of the state, we'd only had three of those up to 1987, and those had occurred in the 70s and late 80s. Since then, we've had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of those uh, in the 2000s, which is at least six inches of rain over a thousand square miles. Uh, and I, this is this the data was as of 2016, and I think we've had one more since then in, in 18 as well. So um, again, there's just becoming more uh, more common to have extreme rainfall events. Um, it's throughout all of Minnesota, but uh, um, uh, as we brought up on the on the, the charts above, this is for the local area itself that we're seeing them uh, them, them happen more often. Um, I don't see anything that says that uh, this trend is going to change. Um, as our uh, with climate change, as our air is getting warmer toward the poles, we get less uh, difference in the temperature between the poles and the equator, and that tends to slow down the westerlies. And when that happens, you allow more uh, warm, moist air to come up north from the Gulf, as well as as uh, more drier intrusions from the north. But you just tend to get warmer air masses that can hold more moisture. And when you can hold more moisture, you drain more moisture out of it. And I think that's what we've been seeing, and and, and that trend uh, certainly looks like it's going to continue. Great. So that's all for this. That's all the slides that I have. I'd be certainly happy to uh, uh, have a discussion and answer any questions. Great, uh, thank you, Craig. Have. We're we're a little short on time now, but I'm going to still ask if anybody had any questions they'd like to ask of Craig. I just have one, Mike. So yep, go Craig, ahead, Bruce. The Atlas 14. I see it's referenced here in the bottom of many of your slides. So a 100-year Atlas 14 storm, 24 hours, is that what, what uh, amount of rain is that in our area? For the 24-hour? Yeah. In this case, the, the current. Well, you're this, this, but it's it's a 2% storm now. But if, what what is the design standard for Atlas 14, 100-year storm? Seven point inches. It's like 7.14 or something like that, or what is it? 7.4. 7.4? Yes. Okay. So it's increased from six inches to 7.4. That's what we're. Yeah, I think that's what you're looking for. Yeah. Anyone? Oh, I'm sorry. There's also a number of, uh, of people are already asking when we're going to update a lot of this. Atlas 14, because it seems like things are already changing that rapidly that we could probably even uh, get an update to that. It's just uh, getting it funded and getting it on the way. It does. Charlie, any questions? No, no, I've seen a lot of this stuff already. So um, it's all good information. Um, as with anything, you can use statistics to, to prove a point and but without question, we need to be prepared for larger events. Yep. Thank you. Well, Craig, thanks again. And um, if you could please forward your slides to Diane, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. And if you have a chance to dig in and 
pull some um, more specific information for our watershed um, in or, or lower min, whatever sort of granularity you have, it would be uh, great to see. Yeah, I should, I should be able to do that. I, just, I can't give you a time period yet, but I should be able to do that for you. That's okay. Would be uh, just appreciate the, uh, the offer and uh, the willingness to help us. Certainly. And then Thanks. something else real, real quick. Um, so I don't know if any of you here or other people that have seen from the watershed district, um, we do a project with the Minnehaha Creek District where we give them a precipitation forecast in six hourly amounts for seven days um, hmm. just for the watershed. And um, that's something we'd be probably willing to do for you guys as well. It falls right out of our database, so it's not an extra uh, workload or anything. Oh, um, that'd be awesome. Like, well, Craig, um, yeah, this is Diane. Craig, we, we actually knew about that. And I talked with Jamie Rockney, our water resources specialist, and we didn't know to uh, what extent it would be that applicable because the information you're taking is from Chanhassen right it's not from well, a, the prior lake area no, we, we, we can create a, a, an area that is exactly your watershed okay and give you the forecast for that it's from our office our office in chanhassen is producing that but we can do that for uh basically any area that that, that needs it oh great we can talk more about that then thank you so much yeah, let's, let's let's be into uh, you know let me know what you're what you what you'd like sometime or we can get on the phone and, and chat okay. about it okay great you and thanks too. for um, being our speaker with short notice, we really appreciate it. <laughs> yes. Certainly. Thanks, Craig. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thanks a bunch and take care. You too. Thank you. So, Diane, before we move to the next item, I had Kurt trying to call me uh, during oh. this. So I'm going to see. Jamie, do you have a, do you have Kurt's phone number? Do you have a chance to give him a call and see if he's uh, struggling to get in or doesn't have the call in information? I don't. Yeah, I, I got him. I'll call him. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. Call oh, Kurt Hand. Um, okay, Diane, let's move on to the, the next item then the fund transfers, the existing sure. request. And, you know, as I'm thinking about this, I don't know how much it's in, how important it is for me to ever get the control of the screen because most of the stuff I think we're going to turn back to you to, to talk through. So, okay. Um, Let's just do it that way for now. Okay, so um, the first fund transfer is, we call it the existing request. So um, what we're uh, doing there is we have um, to, uh, let's see, um, we had su suggested that Hang on. Oops, I got the wrong one in front of me, no wonder. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, the approved expenditures, that's what it's called, on May 12th. So um, we were a little short um, due to uh, my mathematical error when we did a, a transfer in on uh, April 24th. So we're about $9,678 short. So what I did is I indicated um, that we need to come up with that shortfall. And if you look on the second page of that item, I suggested that we get that by taking uh, things from the uh, 2020 budget, which would be moving budget items. So the mitigate channel erosion, that would be going, the boundary change exploration, that would be going. So that's 7,000 right there that would go towards that shortfall. And then uh, 2,678 that was in the Pike Lake MDL implementation 2019 rollover, which is what was um, indicated on Charlie's report. So the total would be 9,678 to cover that shortfall. So that's the first request. And then the second request is for the ferric chloride improvement, improvement project. That we, uh, we, uh, Somebody has got the uh, somebody on the phone and their computer. I'm not sure, but I'm, I'll plug in here. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. There we are. Somebody's corrected it. Thanks, Diane. Sorry, okay. Diane. Yeah, Panga. Um, yeah. So um, for the the uh, for Accord, we're a improvement project. As you probably recall, we did approve 
uh, paying for it on March 10th, and Maggie had identified a number of ways to do that. Um, we since when we applied uh, the the um, public infrastructure partnership project budget of $100,000 to the Elm treatments, we took out what uh, about $12,000 that um, Maggie had suggested be taken to help pay for this project. So. What I did is I reconfigured that as well. So the um, if you look at the 90,544, um, we've got uh, four rollovers there. And those again were identified by Charlie in his report that he'll discuss later on. But um, one was 25,000 from the ferrochloride barrier rollover that we um, had budgeted in 2019. 14, Diane, you're cutting out. Hmm. 14,000, can you hear me now? Yes. So I don't know, it seems like if you're moving or turning your head, you get away from the speaker or something. I'm not yeah. seeing Well, I've got a headset on and um, apparently I just have to hold on to the speaker. <laughs> so yeah. it goes with my <laughs> hand. Okay, um, so 14,130 for our cart management, um, which was from the 2019 budget, uh, 12,835 from BMPs. And then we've got Fish Lake and Pike Lake TMDL implementation rollover. And those were because they uh, we just the PCA has simply not gotten forward, come forward with their TMDL plan. So um, and then 20, 000, 23,000 from rough, rough fish management. So what I'm asking the board to do is to approve both motions in this one um, memorandum. Thanks, Diane. But so the first thing I want to do is you and I and Charlie had an exchange on email and I know Chris has joined us now. Can you please confirm though, as, as I understand it, we moved all quote unquote unspent funds from 2019 into the general fund. We do not have any line items that are called rollover. That's correct. So really any rollover is spending um, our general fund slash reserves at this point, correct? Correct. So, okay. so. Um, and I guess it's a preference. Uh, I wanted to be able to show you where it was coming from. And I recognize that it's kind of moot because when it rolled over from 2019, it kind of came into a big pool. But right. you could see though that some of it was budgeted for this item that we ended up not spending in 2019 and we rolled it over but then also oh. taking additional funds ah uh, now now i understand why you, you might have gone through that i wasn't sure okay. what the purpose of the exercise was so right yes okay okay fair enough i didn't have any questions so i'm going to see if any of my colleagues do. what's that thank you hey mike yes kirk is over in my house now so he's oh He's on the meeting. Okay. And you wow. opened the door, huh? Well, yeah. <laughs> so what did I do? No. Isn't that against the law? Yes, it is. <laughs> Send in the I'm about so five more feet away from me, Kurt. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay, great. So let me uh, just for, for then Kurt and Bruce, I'm thinking you, Bruce, you were tied up chatting with Kurt. Uh, Diane just reviewed the the two budget transfers that these are both items really that we've spoken about from a board perspective we know we need to do um, and i think we've agreed that we just didn't we just haven't done the official action to move the funds into the respective categories to move forward with these two projects uh, one that's already moving forward so um let me just see are there any questions i mean maybe i'll yeah. even open it up to charlie first who's who's yeah. been with us the longest and was following. Charlie, any questions on your side? I, I do. Um, can we put the memo up on the screen so we can see it, please? Yes, let me see if I can get that quickly here. Okay, there it is. 
Yeah, so go down um, to where he is. Um, okay, so, because Diane, you emailed me a little earlier today, you know, kind of wondering about the numbers in, in my treasurer's report, and I'm just going to explain to you where I got them from, and maybe I was mistaken, but under here, it talks about discussion, and it goes into uh, alum treatment uh, paragraph, and then the fecal chloride wear improvement paragraph. But then on the next page, it, right there, that's the recommendation. So I was only looking at these numbers and I wasn't even looking at the numbers above it. But I guess what I'm hearing is when you, when you indicate in these numbers about 2019 rollovers, um, it's the sum of all of those plus the ones in the paragraphs on the previous page, is that correct? Or do these recommendations wipe out what was in the previous paragraph? Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Um, no, this these, the other ones were just by purpose of history, but the, these two recommendations are the one to follow, absolutely. And so okay. I, I understand that this is one of the things I had a question about, and I totally yep. get what you did. I didn't, okay. didn't see it right away, but it's like, oh, yeah, of course, because that's the only thing from 2019. So, yeah. Okay. And, and including the next one, the fecal. Um, Paracloride. Paracloride, right? Yep. Yep. Same thing. Yep. I just took that 9544 and minus out just the 2019s. And that's what I used in my my spreadsheet. So I just want to make sure that we are on the same page. And it kind of sounds like we are now. Yeah, so let me just. Um, so then my other question really is just what you're asking uh, for us I, to approve. Can I ask, just to ask you a question though? I, I still, okay, so I when I added up the rollover numbers, let me try that again. I, I got a different number, so just a minute. Uh, So, Charlie, aren't we um, really, we are maybe moving some budget, um, 2020 budget, and then literally all of the rollovers are just, uh, that's the total draw that we're going to do out, out of the general fund to fund the project. So we need to make a motion, I believe, to move um, like the ferric chloride, or sorry, well, now she just moved it. Yeah, right here. Um, it's right here, the motion. Yeah. Yep. So there you go. The two yeah. motions. Yeah, and I'm I'm fine with you. What you put down, Shirley. Yep. Okay. Good. Yeah. No, you're right, Mike. I I wanted to know what the 2019 rollovers were because that's separate line items in my spreadsheet to keep track of reserves. Transferring 2020 oh. budgets from one line item to another 2020 budget line item has nothing to do with my spreadsheet whatsoever. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> yeah, because you're quote unquote rollover, you're tracking everything that would go into the, the, the reserves. So you can give us an accurate number. Is that what yes. I'm hearing? Got uh, it. Yes, at least attempting to. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Um, so those were my, that was my question. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, Bruce or Kurt? Yeah, I've got two questions on the memo down a little bit. I mean, just a minor one, but the alum reserve number there that Charlie has is 384,596. And you're, you rounded it up to 385. So just. Well, it was 385 in the budget. But I'll bet you um, what Charlie did is he took off something that we've already spent on it. Is that right, Charlie? No, no. The, um, Chris probably can weigh in on this one. The, it's my understanding that the official alum reserve number is 384,596. And when you were preparing the budget, I think you merely just rounded it up in the budget, I presume. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I, I, right? that's I believe that's the case. This okay. is Chris. Okay. I, the only reason so I just, it's kind of I issue. Issue. we wrote short again 
or can we make it work? Right. Okay. And my other question is, in the 2020 budget, what I see for ferric chloride carp barrier, at least on the sheet that I printed out, is 38,000. Why? What? What's it? Why the difference there? Or what's going on there? I guess. Am I seeing something wrong, or what? What, what am I seeing? Did everybody follow me? If you look at the budget. Yeah, I see. Oh the budget. yeah. The reason is that we already. Um, I believe I looked at this before. We, we had already spent ten thousand of it, so there's not that that much that we can. Uh, to get in front of me here. Well, I'm just I'm just thinking it might be more than three thousand. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yep. Yeah. So. <clears throat> I mean, we need to do the two projects. I just want the numbers to maybe. Yeah, so we had, um, we said 2019 rollover because we, we had 35,000 budgeted, but we spent 99.21 in 2019. So we couldn't roll over 35,000. There wasn't 35,000 to roll over. Okay, but my question is what we show for 2020 budget right. is 38,000 for the ferric chloride. That's because we had, we only put for our levy was only 3,000 and the 35,000 was a carryover. So oh. we had, yeah, so we had carried over 35 and we had three and then so the total available funds we had was 38,000. Now this was, of course, um, it was you know our final budget, but we didn't have the numbers in about how much we'd actually spent. So okay. we now have the actual numbers, and we spent ten thousand of that already. What did we spend ten thousand on, Diane? I would like to have Maggie weigh in that in on that if you could. Do you remember Maggie? Uh, Mr. Chair, managers, Diane. Uh, so we spent that ten thousand dollars on engineering and rebidding the project. We had quite a struggle with um, getting a fabricator that could also install, and so it was um, a rebid after the August board meeting. Um, if you recall that conversation, um, and so there's ended up being a lot more engineering for this one than we originally anticipated. So I, I do recall that, but I think Bruce's comment, so even if we had 38 in the budget for 2020 for this project, and if we if you spent 10K, that leaves 28K left in the 2020 budget for this project. Well, correct. Well, yeah, so that's that is true because what we do is we have the 25,000 from 2019 rollover. We had said in our budget that we'd have 35, and like we just No, discussed, sorry. Sorry, Diane, let me let me pause you. I thought so again, rollovers are are they're not in a rollover account unless they're actually still identified for that category. And I so I don't well I, I, just so we don't get confused, because if whatever all the stuff that you're listing in here is rollovers or rollovers that I believe we made uh I remember at some point we made a motion to move all of the, not all, but most of the specific items, the rollovers that we didn't, the unspent money from 2019 moved into a general fund, but not all of them. For example, the alum treatment was always left in the alum treatment reserve. So. Well, and, and right? Right, frankly, I don't remember that there was a motion made to that effect, but like I said, you know, the, the reason why I listed this in the staff memos this way, is so that you could follow where the money was coming from. So, um, you know, when we, like I said, when we put our budget together, we didn't have a column that said 2019 carryover. 
you know, and we also had a, a line that, or a column that said 2018 prior year carryover. So, uh, which is um, how we identify Alan. Somebody's got a yippy dog that they yeah. could mute. Yep, yep. Hang on, that's mine. Uh, but I can't talk and mute at the same time. So, um, so let me go put them away. And We've lost you again, Diane. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to put the dogs away because I have a note that said you can't hear me, right? So, so just a minute. Just hang on. But anyways, what I was saying is that the way that I put it in there was... Diane, we can't hear you. You can't hear me now? Partially. Well, that's strange because I'm nothing's changed. I was just standing up. Um, okay. Well, something must. Something is changing when you move from whatever that microphone is. But when you're right on it, after we talk about it, then we can hear you just fine, or at least I can. Okay. So, anyways, I have to put the dogs in their kennels because if I mute the line, you're going to hear. You can't hear me talk. Gotcha. So, but anyways, the, the reason that I did the memos this way was so you could see where the money was coming from. And it's based on how we set up the 2020 budget because we did have a carryover, two carryover columns in the budget. And I, very honestly, I don't remember that we did a motion to merge all the items into kind of a, a general, just into the general fund for 2020. But I will be back in just a minute. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Does anybody else um, from the board remember that? Or then I'll even probably end up asking um, Chris as well. But Charlie, do you remember that? I remember a conversation. I don't remember I, if we I, did a formal yeah. action. No, I remember this probably was where are we in May right now? So this was yes. probably February's meeting or thereabouts. Yeah. And we definitely did something as far as these rollovers and and keeping keeping a small portion designated to a certain line item, but the rest of it, you know, going into the big pot. Right. And I think, you know, my argument the entire time is you don't even need to do that. It all just reverts to the major pot after each calendar year. Um, and uh, but nonetheless, there was some sort of action taken that said, okay, of the hundred and forty five thousand dollars, you know, nine thousand went here and twenty thousand yeah. went there. Um, I don't remember the specifics, but I remember us doing something, yes. Yeah, okay. Hey Chris, do you have any do you have a recollection of what we did? Uh I don't really. Um I I'm kind of in Charlie's camp where once we've um, fully costed out 2019, whatever's left over rolls into, you know, it's available to be used because it's, uh, it's unspent funds from prior years. Um, I think one of the, one of the takeaways here, um, just while Diana's away, I do intend one, once we kind of figure out all of the recommendations here and, and do whatever approvals that we think is appropriate, I am going to build up a budget again, similar to what you approved originally that shows all of these changes that will that will come in. And as part of that, I'll be able to vet these numbers. I mean, there's there's a lot of line items going on here. Um, yep. So it's gonna take some time to, to vet that and make sure that we haven't overstepped uh, what we have available. In total, I don't believe we have. So all right, thanks, Chris. But let me, I'm going to kind of go back to, well, it's sort of two points to me. So Bruce correctly identified, we have 38K in the 2020 budget. And so even though the current financial cash position at the end of April, so as of two weeks ago, does not show the funds that Maggie said have been spent to date. Um, so then that's not, at least we're not getting up-to-date or accurate information, but even if that is 10K that's been spent, I trust Maggie on that, it still means that we have in the 2020 budget, the 28K for this project, so we would not need additional general fund dollars to pay for this project, correct? I mean, Charlie, Chris, I mean, 
and Bruce, Bruce, that's where Bruce landed. So I, I'm kind of concurring with Bruce that that must be accurate. Yeah, yes. I think that's correct. Yes, yeah, so you don't need additional money. It's all there. It, it's essentially it's it's within the budget already. I think Diane's yeah. showing how she's going to cost out this full ninety thousand five hundred and forty four, of which at that top line item there, the twenty five thousand um, seventy nine dollars, I believe, is already built within that budget, within the current twenty twenty budget. But okay, but that's okay. So this, but the recommendation though is inaccurate because the twenty twenty budget then. Let's say it is the 25 and the three, so it should say 2020 budget of 28079. I believe, Diane, well, is that maybe what you were trying to do though? But this is really that is 2020 budget, correct? Okay, so it, it no, if you look on the budget that you approved, it is not, it's we have 35,000 as a carryover from 2019. So let me. And we I'm have looking only at, three thousand. So I, of the budget, I'm talking about the budget. That's what. So let me. I'm gonna yeah. go. We're gonna go to the 509 project, ferric chloride carp barrier, time replacement project. Thirty-eight thousand dollars in the 2020 budget. Right, but thirty-five of that was coming from 2019's budget. No, it but, was no, but it's the 2020 budget is thirty-eight thousand dollars is in our 2020 budget. So this is kind of a horse apiece. The way that we have been using this budget in the past was we were showing where we were taking money from previous years. It's fine if you don't want to do that. And I explained earlier on that I was doing that so you could you could see a trail. So this is the trail. You know, this is where we came from to get this money. It was earmarked. Some of it was earmarked. Some of it was earmarked for something else. Yeah, but the bottom line is, period. You know, uh, you know, if you look, if you look at the the bottom line in our budget, it would say thirty five, thirty eight thousand, right? So, so that's why I, I think yeah. Diane, I understand where you're trying to show things, but when we do have a budget for showing the, what dollars are available in our current budget. I think then to call some of those rollover from a, a previous year is extremely confusing. Um, I, I understand maybe on some of the others where you were trying to earlier say that these funds, you know, they were left over from 2019. They were earmarked for these kinds of activities. So it's okay to use general fund dollars. But um, I think specifically Bruce is, I think, bringing up a relevant question to, you know, a relevant item that it's very confusing to do that for something that we've already I budgeted something for. So anyway, I, I don't think we need to beat a dead horse. I think we know that that must mean there is 28,000 from the ferric chloride budget in the 2020, but I think it's probably being more accurate and just then suggest those other four listed rollovers are really the use of general fund dollars. Hey, okay, Charlie and Chris, yeah, go for it, Bruce. You know, and I've been really studying this pretty hard, and I think some of the confusion is, and Charlie's done a real good job for, you know, five years, he's finally figured out where our reserves are and get a good spreadsheet. But in our budget then, the budget that we approve, what's in there is the tax levy dollars we approve with grant dollars and rollovers, which really are reserve money that goes into reserve. So it's really important that we know what exactly we are spent, what's in this budget or in, you know, might affect our reserves, which are getting really tight. So that's why I raised the question. It's, it's yes. more than just a budget number. Well, how much of our 2020 budget really is rollovers or reserves that are built into that budget? Yeah, and I'm, they shouldn't be reserves in my opinion. Those are different items, but this, you know what, we're not going to solve this right now, um, but we do have to get a handle on this because. Well, well, we do have it yeah, in the budget again. We did have a bottom line number was 245 from 218 and then 375 from 219 that we rolled over. And, you know, so we do have that number. Yeah, I'm just. 
Diane, I mean, yeah. you can see the confusion. We've, we've been having, um, it's been confusing ever since I've been on it. Um, we're trying to wrestle it down, trying to make it better, but you can even see, again, we're, there's still a lot of confusion in the language, how things are being talked about. And I, it makes me extremely uncomfortable when we're in these situations um, to be doing this and trying to make decisions. And, um, and I, I don't think I'm alone on this is what I'm also hearing from others. But um, well, okay, so well, again, I was being real clear on where the money was coming from. It's easily, yep. you know, for what we certainly can do, is because the bottom line of what we have to do, Chris, if you're still on, is we do have to make some changes for the in the 2020 budget if we're moving money around. So any of that's any of those items that talk about a 2019 rollover, we can just ignore because it's in the, in, in the big reserve fund. But what we do have to do, so as uh, Bruce pointed out, you know, none of what we have here for the ferrochloride Weir Improvement Project has to be reallocated. It's fine, you know. Um, yep. So uh, now, the, the however, you know, I said, let me take that back. Um, let me just go down the right. Here we go. So this is the right one that I want to refer to. So yeah, so any of the 2019 rollovers, we can just ignore. The 2020 rough fish management, the 23,000, that is a line item that we want to move to the ferric chloride barrier. So we do want to move this one to in the 2020 budget to help pay for the barrier. So that one, Chris, correct? That one we do have to get a motion from the board to do. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. So that's the only so we, one there that has to so be So we don't need move. Sorry to do a clarification. So we yeah. don't need a motion to use general funds to fund this line item? Is that what you're saying, Diane? That's what I'm understanding based on our conversation. Because we didn't we didn't actually have a reserve fund per se in our 2020 budget. But we're don't we have to transfer general fund dollars then into this line item in order to fund this project? Mike? Well, I don't yes. think we need to do an actual um trade. Uh, general fund transfer. I think that the important part here is that we know where the where the dollars came from. As I rebuild the budget, which will be a revision to what was approved at the tail end of um, 2019, I need to pull dollars. For instance, these the items, the majority of the items that are listed as 2019 rollover those have a specific column that they land in when we're when I'm fulfilling what the actual budget expenditures are going to be. So this this tale helps me figure out where these dollars originated from. Again, the bulk of that is 2019 as you can see Diane Okay. Somebody's uh we got some anyway. Okay, so so for yeah, so for the for this one, it's the twenty three thousand transfer from the rush fish management into the ferric chloride wear improvement project, and then for the okay. alum shortfall, we're going to just ignore the twenty nineteen, and what we're going to need to do is move the five thousand and the two thousand um, into the alum project. Okay, so. So I can move this. those up there if you want me to, I think. Oh, no. I yep. So let me, I just, I'm going to make sure. Kurt, did you, I didn't get give you a chance. Kurt, did you have any additional questions? Otherwise, we're going to try and try and move forward. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So I would then entertain a motion to um, move the two items for the Allen Project, the $5,000 Identify and Mitigate Channel Erosion from the 2020 budget and the $2,000 boundary change exploration 2020 budget into the alum, um, alum treatment fund. So moved. Second. 
We have a motion by Bruce, second by Kurt. Again, roll call vote. Um, Bruce, how do you vote? Aye. Kurt, how do you vote? Aye. Charlie, how do you vote? Aye. Mike votes yes as well. Thank you, gents. So then the second item is a single uh, movement of the 23,000 from the 2020 rough fish management into the ferric chloride weir improvement project. Do we have a motion? So moved. Kurt? Second. And then Bruce says a second. Um, Kurt, how do you vote? Aye. Bruce, how do you vote? Aye. Charlie, how do you vote? Aye. Mike votes aye too. Thank you, everybody, and sorry for for the challenges in that. All right, so the next item, the fund transfer, the new request. Diane? Is he already do this? Did he already talk? Yeah. yeah. He's pretty important. Okay, so this one is for two items, um, the upper watershed blueprint, which we're going to be voting on um, later on in the meeting, and then for additional monitoring. So um, the upper watershed blueprint, uh, we anticipate it would be about $90,000 if you take the consultant fee, as well as district engineer's oversight, which I plan on about $10,000. And I recommended that we would roll over <laughs> the um, wetland plan update for 17.5 into that. Um, the $10,000 that we have in the upper watershed storage plan. And then I suggested a contingency rollover. Uh, we did have a contingency in 2019 um, that we would take 62,000 from that. So Given what we just did with the other one, we're not going to have to say anything about this, but what the motion would be is to move the 17.5 and the 10,000 into an upper watershed blueprint, which will be a new um, line item. Um, and then, yes, go ahead. Diane, can we just do these one at a time? Sure. I think that I, I'd prefer that we do these one at a time. So. Yep. Yep. So, any questions from anybody on the upper watershed blueprint? Oh, I got one. Go ahead, Bruce. Is this, I mean, I think if I remember right, you know, our but our two consultants, their fees were like 69 and 75 or 1,000. Yeah, 78 was Wanks, I believe. 78, we didn't know if we're gonna go. Do we really think we're gonna need $12,000 of district engineer? Review time. Or that, are we just being that, that was of, that was just a guess on my part. Yeah, um, that's I what just, I thought. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we had what we needed. So I mean, we don't have to, we don't have to go up to that, but you're being right. conservative to make sure we have enough to go right. There. Right. Okay. That that was my one question because I I can't believe we'd spend that kind of money on a review time, but yeah, that's a lot of money for a review. Kurt, anything further? No, I'm fine. Otherwise, Charlie, how about you? Any any questions, thoughts? I know. Okay, I didn't have anything either. Then I would entertain a motion to amend the, or to move the um, ten thousand out of the upper watershed storage plan. And the 17500 of the comprehensive comprehensive wetland plan update into the upper watershed blueprint fund. I turn the mic on. Uh, so moved. Second. Bruce, Bruce and Kurt as a second. Uh, Bruce, how do you vote? I vote A. Yay. Kurt, Kurt, how do you vote? Aye. Charlie, how do you vote? Aye. Mike votes aye. That motion passes. Thanks, everybody. Okay, Diane, next. Okay. Um, the next one is additional monitoring for 2020. Now, this is something that we talked with you folks, I think, at least a couple times about. Um, this type of monitoring is in addition to what we normally do. Um, it's in our, our uh, monitoring plan now. We have a 10-year plan. And what it is is uh, we'd like $2,700 for zooplankton and phytoplankton. 3,000 for wetland monitoring and 2,200 for macro and habitat assessment. So 
So the reason why phytoplankton are important is that they're microscopic aquatic plants that help you evaluate water quality and the quality of food available to the zooplankton. And the zooplankton are kind of like the canary in the coal mine, and they can signal changes. If you have new invasive species or toxic substances, um, and then wet, wetlands water quality will be monitored by a potential project, as well as identifying the index of biological integrity to measure the health of wetlands. Um, and finally, macroinvertebrates and habitat assessments help determine the health of streams, such as ditch 13 pelock, which is impaired for biota now. That's that uh, mystery uh, type of impairment that the PCA hasn't quite gotten their hands around, but we know that it's impaired for that, as well as the Buck Lake Channel. So um, in order to pay for that, uh, actually, we had indicated that we wanted it rolled over. And so I guess it's just would be a general fund transfer, but it is a new budget item. So we would need your approval to add this to the budget. Yep. So. I actually want to kick this off, um, Diane, because I've I've been thinking about this, and and I want to remain open to requests, or I am going to remain open for requests from staff for maybe new budget items. But what I'm concerned about for this is probably just again a process item at this point um, that we haven't done, um, you know, a proper memo asking for like a, for a request for a new budget item with a little more background or more background than this. Oh, that's think, not enough background right here that I just- Yeah, I don't think so because, well, so I've got some questions about, you know, we, when we cut it, so why are we, why is it coming back? Um, I'd like to know, for me, I was struck by, okay, so this is a one-time request, but it's probably got ongoing maintenance to do this stuff, um, you know, year, year over year. And so I'm not sure if I understand why, why this is coming up now and what the total costs are to the district. So, and I think what, from my perspective, what we're trying to do in these memos that Bruce and put a process in place that Bruce had suggested was so that we would understand the full implications of any sort of request, not just for that year, but ongoing maintenance. And so, I'm, well, I'm, so I'd just like to see this rewritten and brought back, but those are my thoughts and I'm then going to see if my colleagues have any thoughts. Anyone else want to go next? And and oh. also if, if Jamie, Jamie um, knows this field better than I do. So Jamie, yep. if you want to add anything to it um, that, that would help them understand it better, that'd be great. I guess I would just add that, um, I don't know if it was clear that this um, was originally discussed and there was a memo that was put together um, that included all of the additional monitoring and we discussed that when we were putting the budget together last year and then um, it when we removed the water quality database I think you guys had discussion about moving that around this just um, accidentally got removed as well so it, it, it was discussed um, at two different and um, we could pull, get, you know, get that memo back and look over that again. But um, also, this is the beginning of uh, just expanding into biological monitoring in the watershed because most of our monitoring is just focused on chemistry and quantity. So um, this information is also included in that long-term monitoring. Like, Diane mentioned. So the numbers that you're seeing here are um, going to be similar for the next 10 years. Over the next 10 years, this is the amount that we're going to be asking for um, on an annual basis. On an annual basis. Yep. So we don't yep. have any sort of baseline data for biological monitoring. So this is just um, we're going to start getting some sort of baseline data in different water bodies. So again, I'm I'm not against this at all, Jamie. I just wish that we had done this and had uh, more information. So that's what I'm I'm sharing with my colleagues at this point. So I'm going to see what else anybody else, Charlie, Bruce, Kurt, anybody. Uh, this is Bruce. Um, 
Yeah, I think it's part of our 10 year monitoring plan, but I'm concerned we've really been hitting our general fund or our reserve fund. Yeah. And I don't want to make a decision on this item until we really know what we have, what is coming in from FEMA, what is really coming in from Scott County, the, the property tax first payment, because we could have some big hits here. And if this doesn't have to be done this year, but it's going to be ongoing proper way to do it is put it in the budget for next year and because if it was cut for this year there's a reason for it and to bring it back now there better be a good reason that we have to do it otherwise i'm not going to be supported of it kurt do you have anything yeah with the um, as far as the property tax we got to be very careful because you know darn well with the virus and people not working not getting their regular income there's going to be a a lag in the funds that should be collected so we have to be very careful charlie any thoughts i generally agree uh with what bruce stated um that we might be dipping a little too much and it's not just it's not the right time on the yeah. other hand we just dipped sixty-two thousand five hundred to do the upper watershed plan so we didn't bat an eye at that so let's make sure we're consistent um but yeah let's uh let's maybe retable this one so um i would like to just add um for your consideration um the macro invertebrate and wetland monitoring um we haven't actually started that but i did um start with the zooplankton and phytoplankton so um that would be the $2,700 line item. If you maybe want to consider just adding that one back, we um, were, this is only monitoring one lake, but it's for upper prior lake. So I wanted to see um, the difference before and after the alum treatment on upper prior lake. So um, we've only taken one or two samples, so there's not that much, but um, I, that's for about um, eight, samples, eight separate samples throughout the year. Um, and then we also grabbed one or two on Spring Lake because they're having that brown um, algae bloom again. So if you want, we can uh, stop it. There's just been a little bit of money spent there, but otherwise um, I think it would be really in interesting information to see how um, that does change in Upper Prior Lake, especially um, before and after the alum treatment, and then also on spring lake to confirm that that is that brown um, algae diatom bloom again. Hey, Mike. So, yeah, go ahead, Bruce. Well, I'm looking at our monitoring budget now, 87,000. Yep. And I would have to ask Jamie, do you, don't you have enough leeway or ability to adjust within that budget to pick up that 2,700? Are you going to be right at 87100? Uh last year we spent like 86,100. Like that's something that we do every year and we have, you know, a pretty good idea of what that's going to run. So, you know, it's possible um it it might sneak in there or or it might go over a little bit. But I'm guessing you know, sometimes in tough budget situations you have to look at what can I maybe reduce in my budget to take care of the things that I feel are priority? That's just me talking. Yeah, I guess if, if it does come down to that, I'd be willing to, you know, get rid of um, some monitoring that we have do have more history on if, if you're willing to, um, you know, take on if we can, can finish this program that we started this year for the zooplankton and phytoplankton since we I guess I would consider it a little bit more priority to start getting some data rather than to um, continue with the so, that we've had over the years. So this, um, I've heard one thing that's sort of it's disconcerting then that if we are starting new fun, new projects that we don't have funded, um, Diana, I don't know if you might want to copy on or comment on that, but. Um, it's a little disconcerting that we might be doing stuff before we actually have budgets for it. Um, and then secondly, I'm also on the mind even now to stronger to have um, you come back next month and have us 
maybe once we get a settling of where we are from a financial perspective, because of the reasons both Bruce and Charlie have commented and Kurt, and then we sort of relook at this on where we're at, and you guys go look internally um, where you're at on the monitoring plan for 2020 and expenditures. But Diane, any comment on the starting projects that we don't, we haven't funded? That would be that would be more my fault than Diane's. I, like I said, we we had that approved um, last year, and I didn't realize that that was accidentally um, removed from the budget. Because um, when we had discussed it, it was it was approved. So I and I wasn't aware that it was removed before we started talking about it or before I started planning it. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, at this point, it does sound intriguing, Jamie, but I mean, I don't think this is the right time um, to be asking for additional funds at this point. I just ask you guys to push off. I'll see if my colleagues support that, but I'd say any requests like this, uh, you got to look at internally right now what you have on the budget, like Bruce said. Um, that's what I'd recommend. So, but I'm going to see if my colleagues where they stand. Bruce. Kurt, Charlie? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, we cut it for a reason. And yep. that monitoring budget, You, if you can't make that work, come and see me. I'll find something for you. Oh, okay. okay, so um, I just wanted to reinforce what Jamie said. And thanks, Jamie. Um, it was cut because, very honestly, and Chris, are you still on, on the line? Yeah. Um, Chris and I were trying to figure out how to make the numbers work. And this was one that, um, because as Jamie mentioned about whiskey, it was kind of tied up in the whiskey. So I just offered that. Um, that was my fault. And I should have only offered the whiskey portion, not the portion yep. that had the phytoplankton in it. And so, of course, we didn't know where we were going to settle out at the end of the year when we did the budget. And so what I asked both Maggie and Jamie to do was to tell me, because this is the time, and Chris was really good at reminding me of that, that if we want to transfer some funds from one category to another, we need to do that if it's five thousand dollars or more. So I just asked them both, you know, what, where do we, where do we need to get some funds for your project that we need to transfer over? So that's how Jamie responded. So I think that's fine, Jamie, and I, you and I can talk about it. Diane, you're cutting out. Uh, no, uh, Jamie and I can talk about how we can make it work. Um, and just with the existing budget. So um, I, we won't need to bring it back to you then. Okay. So I will eliminate motion number two. Okay, thank you. Then we will move on to the next item on the CARP genetics. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Maggie. Did you, we have our guest speaker on? Yep, Sam Erickson is available, and if we can allow him to share his screen, he's got a presentation, a real short one for us. Okay, let me just go find him here. Oh, there we go. Okay, Sam, you are the presenter. Very good. Uh, good afternoon. This yeah. is my first time using this application, so thank you for your patience here. So I'm going to well, click and, share. And thank you for getting... Uh, getting on this call at short notice. We really appreciate it. So suppose I do this. Um, is that working? Can you see my yes. slides? Yeah, we can. That's great. Very well. Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. I'm thrilled to have your attention. Um, so my name is Sam. I'm calling over from the University of Minnesota, the St. Paul campus, here to talk about a technology they're working on at the Biotech Institute. It's a new concept for um, sort of a novel means for controlling invasive carp. So on this call, given our time, I'm kind of going on the assumption that all of you are aware of invasive carp in the upper Midwest. You're aware that it's a problem and you believe that we ought to do something about that. As it stands, there really isn't any uh, technology that exists for controlling carp that is um, 
that is effective, that works, that's uh, economically feasible, and that doesn't hurt the surrounding environment. And we're developing a concept to, to change that, to make a new possibility. Um, so this gives a very rough overview of the concept. Um, what I want to do is I want to make a special fish. Um, what I want to do is I want to retrieve some wild carp uh, from, from the upper Midwest and make some genetic modifications to make an engineered fish. Here it's shown our engineered fish for the purpose of illustration is shown in blue. Um, but uh, that's just for illustration purposes. In reality, this fish will be completely indistinguishable from a wild fish. In every way, except for one key feature, that if one of my engineered fish attempts to reproduce with a wild fish, uh, you will result with it, you will get an embryo. That embryo won't succeed in developing to make a mature fish. Uh, and the vision is that you could use controlled small releases of these engineered fish um, combined in sort of an integrated strategy with uh, existing techniques for carp abatement uh, to either uh, control carp populations or even completely eradicate uh, targeted species. Uh, we call this concept EGI or engineered and genetic incompatibility. Um, so that's my job. This is what I work on at the university. I have sort of two projects going in parallel. The ultimate vision is to try to make a working system in common carp, and we believe that um, it will be uh, uh, not not terribly difficult to, if you can make it work in common carp, to demonstrate it in uh, other species, uh, say Asian carp uh, varieties and whatnot. Um, but I have a second project in, in parallel, which I'm trying to demonstrate the same system in zebrafish. Uh, I use zebrafish, we call this, uh, this, this concept a model organism in uh, bio, biosciences research. So for instance, if you're interested in studying, say, a disease in humans, uh, you probably might not start in humans, but you might try to start doing research, say, in mice or in nematodes, and then take those results then into the clinic to study on humans. So I do the same thing, rather than starting with a big, uh, difficult fish, instead I start with a small fish, uh, I call this zebrafish. Uh, that is uh, popular in genetics research and is very well understood. Um, so I work in uh, the, I'm a graduate student, I work in uh, Mike Smansky's lab, the Biotech Institute, and a common theme in our research is, is sort of, there's not quite a, exactly the right, but there's not a consensus about what to call this field of work. Um, there's different words, the three most common I hear are synthetic biology, genetic engineering um, or bioengineering, for the purposes of these talk, these are all synonyms. It's all the same concept. We're all about trying to bias biology into doing something useful otherwise might not do. And um, one area of our research is in sort of control of multicellular organisms. Uh, for instance, we're interested in uh, controlling the spread of transgenes in agriculture. Uh, I want to talk about today invasive species control, and we have some more ambitious concepts for um, controlling disease vectors. But our core uh, sort of expertise and skill set that makes this possible is that uh, we have the tools for reprogramming gene expression. And um, there's so much I'd like to tell you about today, but uh, that's that's not really feasible in this sitting. Um, this is one core concept that I'd like you to remember and uh, and take with you, this notion of a programming gene expression as a key enabling technology here. So um, one miracle of life that I get to witness on a regular basis in my work is I get to watch baby fish develop, starting from a single cell embryo all the way to going to a mature fish. And there's, there's in every step, every time a cell divides, it makes two copies of the entire genome, of all the DNA. So when you're looking at an adult fish made trillions of cells, every single cell in that fish contains the same exact DNA. Um, and what allows a fish to have form, you know, have eyes and have bones and have a brain and have a heart, is that the different cells know which genes to use and which ones not to use and how much to use. And we call this concept gene expression, that you can have genes that can be turned on and off. And not only can they be turned on or off, but they can actually be, they're more like on a dimmer switch, that they can be tightly regulated. And that's what allows a fish to develop proper patterning and to develop a, um, a precise body structure. This technology seeks to disrupt gene expression. What we found is that by disrupting the expression of key uh, regulatory genes, we can actually prevent a uh, fish from developing into an adult. We can uh, kill them very early on in their, uh, their development cycle. 
uh, to understand how this works, we have to look at a gene. So what you're seeing here is a cartoon showing a gene. It's, it's a piece of DNA that has a sequence in it that does something for the fish. Um, what's really cool doing this kind of research in 2020 is we've gotten really good at reading DNA, at looking at it, understanding its syntax, that it's like a language and has different, uh, different, uh, you know, it's it, it, it's it's like it's like a human language that has different structures and and patterns to it. And we're very good at reading it. Um, we're learning now how to write DNA, and we're very quickly getting good at that. We're not that's 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 part of the work here is demonstrating that when you do that, writing DNA that does something useful. Um, but there's sort of two key sections of a gene that when I look at. When I look at a gene, I see two big parts. And there's one part that's shown on the right here, this arrow, that's the coding DNA sequence. That's the, the sort of the, the piece of DNA that encodes the information that has the specific function. But there's another piece of DNA that immediately right in front, sort of a, a prologue that we call the promoter sequence. And that DNA, what it does is it encodes information about where being, which tissues, uh, when, at what stage of development, and how much that this gene should be expressed. And what the our, our key enabling technology that's available now allows us to specifically target particular promoter sequences to upregulate or downregulate uh, genes. And the way we do that is we do it with what's what we call a PTA, a programmable transcription activator. It's a, it's a molecule, it's a very special molecule that I can program to go seek out any gene in the genome, find a particular gene, and very strongly uh, either upregulate or downregulate. We can turn off genes, we can turn on genes. What this allows us to do is we can program a system where we have a molecule that goes and finds a particular gene that's completely unique to a particular organism and upregulate that gene. In our system, what we do is we target really key uh, crucial regulatory genes with our programmable transcription activator uh, at, at, a, at a time of our choosing. Um, to to lethally upregulate a a, a, a a gene. So so an analogy that I like is it, it, the development of a fish is sort of like a symphony, in that you have many different portions. You have a conductor who's essentially um, you know turning on different you know trying trying to coordinate the different genes, and they have to come on and off at very specific levels at certain times. And what we've kind of done is we kind of snuck out a uh, another conductor onto the stage who starts a different symphony that's in a different key at a different time signature and the whole the whole thing crashes out. Um, in order to do that, we have some, some, some tools that are available in synthetic biology. I don't have time to really describe how these work, but and how these work, but uh, there, there's a sort of a concept that I'd like to share that I'd like you to remember. Um, on the left, uh, what we're seeing is a sort of a cartoon of the programmable transcription activator, this uh, sort of compound molecule that I can program to turn genes on and off. Now on the right, we have this transposon system, which is a means of which I can put uh, DNA into a, uh, a fish embryo to test out the system, try to make an engineered fish. Um, but the, 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 the concept I like you to think about is that when we do things in synthetic biology, when we're doing genetic engineering, uh, we, we're never starting from scratch. We're always starting from something that we found in nature. We're sort of repurposing and retooling it to do, it some, to do something useful. Um, it's just a little tricky because we're working with molecules here. Um, in terms of, of so we're not starting from scratch, and really humans have a long history of looking out into nature and finding interesting things and repurposing those. So a, a couple of quick analogies here of things that we found in nature that we've repurposed. Um, but I imagine that maybe one of our ancestors um, many, many years ago was probably walking out on foot sometime out in Eurasia and saw one of these animals on the left and thought, I like that animal. That's a fast animal. You suppose I could, you know, go with that animal? Could I use that animal to do something? Um, I imagine a few people got hurt the first time this was tried, but eventually someone figured out that you could domesticate a horse and you could breed horses. You could breed horses now to have backs that were strong enough to carry people and supplies and whatnot. Um, and a similar thing with fur that, uh, you know, uh, animals with fur were not evolved to provide fur to humans. But uh, now, many, with many years of experience, now we figured out that you know we can hunt or we can uh, domesticate animals to do that. In in our lab now, in the world of genetic engineering, synthetic biology, we're doing the same thing, but we're actually doing it with molecules. 
Yeah. Sam, can I just do a time check with you? Can you please give me a Absolutely. sense for how many more slides do you have? I've got, I think, maybe three or four, and I, Could we're coming up at the, the end If of you this, recall, actually. we're at a pretty high level at a policy level here. <laughs> Um, and I know those that last little bit was probably just fine for us, but if you could keep it at a pretty high level, because um, this is pretty intriguing stuff, but we it's some of it's gotten into the weeds for us. Understood. Understood. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So Thank you. We'll, we'll bring that we'll bring that uh, point to a concept we'll, 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 to a close. What I'd like you to remember, though, here in if if this piques your interest, is that uh, the, the the key concept here is taking elements that are found in nature and repurposing uh, them. So for instance, um, uh, people ask me about this, this, this will come maybe in the future from sort of a safety discussion or whatnot here, that these aren't um, completely novel functions and molecules. Uh, these are actually ones found from nature that have been repurposed. Um, in terms of demonstrating where the system works, we have two really uh, good examples of this working. Uh, my predecessor first demonstrated the concept in uh, a yeast, it's a microbe, and um, some of my colleagues uh, have taken leadership in developing this concept in insects, particularly for control of agricultural pests, um, so much so that uh, one of my colleagues, Siva Das, has uh, started a, a startup company, Novoclade, which is uh, exploring this idea of commercializing this concept for, uh, for insect control. Um, in terms of whether does it work, yes, I, I've shown, demonstrated the system to uh, work in zebrafish, and that's what these slides are intended to, to illustrate. We'll move on from that. Um, in terms of a timeline, um, there's, there's, there's still lots of work that needs to be done before this is anywhere close to being able to be tested in the field. Um, my goal at the moment is to show a completely functioning model that works in captivity in uh, zebrafish, in the, my small uh, genetically tractable fish. Um, uh, so I'm currently working on developing, there's several genetic parts that need to come together to make the system work. Um, and um, that's within several months, I think those different parts can be made. In terms of bringing it to a fully functional model that can be demonstrated um, in the lab, uh, that's more than a year away. The reason for that is that you have, when you have multiple genetic parts, you need to bring them together and that involves a regime of um, of uh, sort of multiple generations of breeding zebrafish to do that. Um, um, at this point, using current technology, which technology has been getting better every single year, there's new tools available, but projecting based on current technology in terms of getting a, uh, a carp that's ready to be tested in the lab, that's uh, more than, probably more than five years away. I'd be surprised if we'd be able to achieve that within um, five years. Uh, the main reason being for that, that with current 2020 uh, genetic engineering tech, we're limited by uh, the generation, the development rate of CARP and um, our ability to, to breed CARP. Um, I'm optimistic that results from the zebrafish study will be able to uh, um, inform, uh, you know, inform CARP research and be able to accelerate that. Uh, next step would then be to test CARP in a controlled environment in a tank, essentially see whether it works on, and then that opens up the whole world of, um, say, trying to do a field study or whatnot. That just gives you the realistic uh, view of the timeline for when this might be able to be tested in, um, say, in a, in a lake in Minnesota. Um, that's based on the time. That's where I'd like to end it. I'm happy to take uh, questions. Um, my research is, uh, is, is uh, supported by Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Research. Species Research Center, uh, we call it MICERC at the University of Minnesota. If you're interested in this work, there are many other projects, um, uh, not ones exactly similar to mine, but many other projects uh, actively ongoing at the University of Minnesota for control of uh, invasive species. Um, my work is uh, co-advised by uh, Mike Spansky with the Biotech Institute and Prashant McBuyer with the Department of Fisheries. Um, with that, I'm happy to uh, take any questions you have. So thank you so much for your time and your attention. Yeah, thank you, Sam. That's uh, interesting work. I'm going to turn this over to Kurt, who had asked to learn more about this. So, Kurt, I'm going to let you go first on this one, sir. Sam, thank you. Thank you for coming before us. I know you're a very busy young man. You're obviously a very uh, dynamic and uh, gifted uh, intellectual when it comes to these uh, type of endeavors. I guess the thing I wanted to say was, are there any avenues that you are... Um, uh, pursuing where you're going to need some test sites, 
some small bodies of water where you'd like to uh, investigate some of your theories? If so, we would absolutely want to be at the top of your list, sir. And we're not that far from you. We're uh, from the uh, university. We're, you know, maybe 30 minutes, 35 minutes. Um, as, uh, right now, no. Maybe um, five years from now, perhaps. To me, that seems like a very long time. Um, I imagine that many of you are very committed to uh, to serving your community, to serving uh, uh, you know Prior Lake, Spring Lake uh, watershed. Um, so maybe for you, that that's that's uh, that, that's if that's a timeline that's 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 uh, that you still be interested in. Uh, that if, you, if this is a, I imagine if you're committed to your watershed for that long, um, then. I would suggest maybe stay in touch um, for the immediate. For now, um, I have a lot of work to demonstrate some of the, uh, the technical nitty gritty up front. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess that's that's the best answer I can give. But right now, um, not really, but that's probably going to happen uh, a few years from now. That's why I anticipate. You can just uh, keep us in the back of your mind, Sam. Just keep in mind that we're very willing participants we throw a lot of money at carp management and as you know that's not the that's not the ultimate solution here because all we're doing is trying to keep the numbers down trying to bring the numbers down and uh, i think you realize and the rest of us certainly realize that this uh this species does huge damage damages to uh quality of lake water and so please 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 keep us in mind down the road whether it's one, two, three, five years, okay? Very well. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to have your uh, your time and attention to share with you uh, this sort of idea in advance. Um, you know, ultimately, it's it's not going to be me making the final decisions about where and when this gets applied. I'm trying to do my best to make a system that works really well and to report exactly how well it works and um, how to use it and whatnot. But ultimately, it's going to be a community effort to, uh, to use this in a in an effective and an ethical way. You got any questions? Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Sam. Any, anybody else? No, not for me. Seeing none. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sam. Intriguing work, and we wish you all the best. For sure. Cheers. Um, think that uh, I'm uh, in other circumstances. I'm I'm very happy to take uh, visitors at the university. We can't do that right now. But um, if there's something you want to be, you're interested in learning more about, um, don't hesitate to uh, uh, reach out. I believe uh, Maggie has my contact information. So um, thank, thank you for your time. I'm going to sign off later. Sam, thank if you ever want to visit us, please feel free to, to contact us. I think you have our phone number on our website. And we'd, we'd be yeah. happy to show you some of the sites where we think would be ideal for, uh, for some test runs for you, OK? Understood. I, I'll, I'll bear that in mind. Thank you for your time. Thanks again. Okay, Diane, we are on to alum and phosphorus metrics and Carl. Yes, Carl is here with Megan uh, Funk, who is on their staff and has done a lot of work on alum. <clears throat> awesome. So, so I will yeah, turn the screen over to you, uh, Carl. Yeah, Diane, if you could turn it over to Megan Funky, okay. please. Sure. And I'll just do a little, real brief introduction but um so my understanding is the board had some follow-up questions that were largely coming out of um this dialogue and bowser assurance agreement and and what that means for committing to reduction for accepting the grants and you know we responded brett responded to to many of your questions but <clears throat> diane had relayed to me that excuse me a little frog in my throat. Um, Diane relayed to me that you all really wanted to just kind of understand this a little bit more simply. You know, what's what's the industry standard driving for how much alum should be applied? You know, how much alum, uh, how many, how much does one gallon of alum bind up? Uh, how many pounds of phosphorus? Some more simple questions. And the more and more I really thought about this, these simple questions don't necessarily have a simple answer. So <laughs> we prepared, albeit short, uh, uh, a little bit more detailed uh, response to just those two primary questions. You know, what do we get? How do we decide how much to dose? 
and what do we expect to get? And I, rather than uh, relay that and then likely have you have all a bunch of questions, I wanted Megan, who is the doctorate and the one that understands the, the science more deeply than I do here and present and be able to answer your questions directly. So with that, I would turn it over to Megan. Great. Great. Carl. Okay, so um, I plan to answer basically three questions. So how do you determine an Allen dose? Uh, what can impact the effectiveness of an Allen treatment? And then how long is an Allen treatment effective? Um, and then I'll end just uh, summing up with how this relates to the Upper Prior Lake Allen strategy. And I, this is weird to present in this. Let's see if I can minimize a bunch of the go to stuff. Let's see. That sharing, see, I thought it might be the double. Does that work? So watch the yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you get a, a preview, I think. Um, so if we go to the very first, um, basically the, there's three things that determine a dose. One is just how much releasable phosphorus is in your sediment. And this is from the sediment core data. This has been collected in Spring Lake, Upper Pyre Lake. And it's really made up of three different types of phosphorus. So phosphate is an ion that gets bound to other things in the sediment. There's some that's loosely bound, there's some that's iron bound, and then there's that's, um, you know, more organic in nature. So think of leaf, leaf material, cells that kind of decompose and release phosphate. Um, you may hear the term redox peak. This is really made up of loosely bound and iron bound in the sediments. So this is the phosphate ions that release when we have oxygen present uh, in the bottom waters. So in the back of the slide, you kind of see I'm depicting the um, kind of half circle is an example of what a lake sediment might be, and the blue just represents the bottom. The little peas are the little phosphate ion. Um, so basically, I'm just representing that you know we have some peas from the sediment, and that we measure those phosphate fractions in those sediment cores, and we've been doing it in two centimeter increments, which is pretty standard uh, in the field. And then we have to look at, you know, how deep in the sediment layer um, are we trying to treat? So where, what's the layer of actively releasing phosphate? And this is usually six to ten, 10 centimeters. I mean, I think the key point is it's a very shallow layer. Whenever you have a water sediment or soil interface, the um, active layer is, is very near the surface. And you can determine this uh, with a little more scientific evidence, uh, you, looking at the releasable phosphorus concentrations and how they decrease with depth. So you can see them decrease and then level off. So we're really focusing on that top part of the sediment where we have increasing phosphorus concentrations, and this is where we're going to have active phosphorus. So this is data from the Upper Fire Lake uh, in Lake Management Plan. So you can see the um, on the bottom, we're showing the three bars are the phosphate uh, levels in the first two centimeters, two to four centimeters, four to six centimeters. So we're focusing on those top six centimeters. And then the last thing, and it's a really important consideration, is it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, if we determine that there's so much total uh, pounds of phosphate in the top six centimeters throughout the whole lake, we wouldn't just add an equal amount of aluminum. So aluminum is an ion and it binds with other things in the sediment. So probably best to think of the alum flock layer as um, having a bunch of binding sites for phosphate, but other things as well. So we want to make sure we have enough binding sites for the phosphate. So one interesting thing about it um, is it's not um, the binding sites you need doesn't increase as phosphate concentrations increase in the sediment. And so this is work uh, Bill James out of UW Stout has really been a leader in the field, worked a lot with a lot of um, consultants uh, on all these alum treatments that have been uh, implemented across the state and just compiled a lot of information. And so there's a, a paper that we um, use now that has an equation that relates the amount of redox phosphorus in the sediments with what uh, 
um, aluminum uh, phosphate binding ratio of blue and Essentially, it's a multiplier. So if we have five pounds of phosphate, we need to add 10 times or 100 times as much aluminum. So, and this is where it's a little counterintuitive, but if we look on the top left of the graph, you can see if you have lower redox phosphate concentrations, so that's that loosely bound, iron bound amount, you have a much higher aluminum to phosphate binding ratio. And basically this, this is related to chemistry, but when you have um, lower concentrations of something, it's gonna be like phosphate, it's gonna be less competitive to bind with your aluminum. So basically you need more alum per phosphate in the sediment. You need more opportunities for those very few phosphate ions to bounce into those binding sites. And it's kind of maybe a uh, easy way to describe that. And if you have higher concentrations in the, the sediment, you actually need you know, a lower multiplier. So you know, your phosphate's gonna be more competitive, it's more likely to find the binding site. And other things are gonna them first. So then when you put it all together, you can look at you know, what your redox phosphate concentration is, which is um, listed here as milligrams per gram in the sediment. And then you can look at what those binding ratios are. So in, in this paper, they were looking at a range of redox from one and a half up to 2.3 milligrams per gram. And so you can see that they were looking at ratios on the order of 18 to 21 times as much. And so it relates to a, a aluminum dose in grams per meter squared. And this is what, you know, when we're comparing across different lakes, kind of the number we look at, ranging from 60 to 132 grams per meter squared. So in Upper Prior Lake, you can see that our redox phosphorus concentrations are a little lower, 0.3 to 0.74. But because those concentrations are lower, we need a higher uh, multiplier. So we have 55 in zone two, which is that uh, deeper area where we have higher concentrations. And in the shallow areas where we have lower concentrations, we get a higher uh, multiplier. But our total aluminum dose is very similar to some, um, you know, a lot of the lakes that we see these alum treatments occurring on. So we're at 98.95. So, and then I only showing this is a, a snippet of a big spreadsheet where we you know use all these equations and these uh fractions of the phosphate there's lots of conversion factors to get from phosphate to uh, aluminum to our liquid alum and our buffer but basically i just wanted to highlight you know we're looking at all these different cores that were collected from upper prior lake we know what depth they were taking from what increment you know we're focusing on top six centimeters after looking at all that data and we really go from you know, on each individual sample, we calculate what that redox phosphate concentration is, what that binding ratio is, and then what the ultimate dose needs to be. And so then we sum all that up um, for the top six centimeters to get at our total dose. So the figure for the upper prior lake treatment dose, um, you can see that the light blue areas are that zone one, those shallow areas that had the lower redox phosphate concentrations in the sediment but that higher um, alum to phosphate ratio. So we had a 98 gram per meter squared um, dose recommended. And the dark blue is that those deeper areas where we have higher phosphate concentrations, but a lower multiplier needed and, and actually a very similar dose required then. So then quickly, what can impact an alum treatment? So one of the key things is there can be drift during application as the flock settles through the water column and this can sometimes have uneven coverage. I would say this is um, managed or minimized a lot with more of the modern GPS tracking system. So this was a bigger problem in um, alum treatments maybe two decades ago when they didn't have the uh, specific GPS tracking. And so HAB who was conducting these treatments actually shows a map of where their barge was at what time and, and the variable rates to make sure that the dose is evenly spread. Sediment disturbance can also cause um, phosphate to bind to the alum flock faster. So, you know, once you mix things up, it's gonna go into those binding spots. So, um, you know, benefit of sediment disturbance is it keeps the flock near the sediment surface, kind of lifts it back up. I think of sediments as really fluffy. It's not solid like soil, um, but it also increases the depth of the treated sediments. So you need a slightly higher dose. Um, so, in areas where there may have been sediment disturbance, you might need a slightly higher dose. 
um, you know, if you go for a second application. And note that in the shallower areas of Upper Prior Lake, that's where we have our higher dose anyway. So it's another safety factor. Um, you know, there's papers that have looked at, you know, what can CARP do on, you know, sediment mixing depth, and that's where a lot of this research came out of, you know, finding that it keeps the flock near the surface, but it can increase the sediment mix mixing depth a little bit. So you might have to add a little bit more where CARP may have some interaction with the sediment. And again, they're not uh, disturbing the entire lake bottom. They would be in kind of key areas. And then probably the most important thing is that there are external sources of phosphorus that can use up the binding sites from the surface. So, you know, we're applying the elm flock, assuming that most of the phosphorus release is coming from the lake sediment from the bottom. But if external sources aren't reduced, you may need to reapply sooner. So it's just part of adaptive management and keeping track of watershed sources that may change uh, during the life of the alum treatment and any upstream lake sources that may change um, kind of in their magnitude. And then last, how long is alum effective? I think this is, um, we give these estimates of, you know, at least 10 years or more, and it's really based on a collection of, you know, well over 100 alum treatments that have occurred. Some of these have been um, in place for decades, and there's a lot of data to look at what those doses were, if the lake was shallow or deep, and what kind of the average expected uh, life expectancy or longevity of that alum treatment is. And, you know, more recent alum treatments are having longer effectiveness, um, you know, the ones that have been around for 10 years or so, just with those improvements in the alum dosing compared to maybe four decades ago. So in Upper Prior Lake, the first half of the total dose um, will be applied in 2020. So I'm representing the alum flock layer as um, that white bar with the binding sites. We have phosphate in the sediment, so we expect to have some phosphate bound up in that elm flock layer. Within the first three years, we're recommending to you know, monitor surface and bottom phosphorus concentrations to determine when and if that second half of the application is needed. Um, you know, there's some unknowns of we need to make sure spring lake elm treatment, um, keep our eye on that, and then always look out for any potential for untreated watershed sources. And so, um, you know, if needed, We'll apply the second half in 20, by 2023. So that's just represented by that second layer. So it just gives more binding sites. And then with all those binding sites in place, we would expect that um, you know, sometime 10 years from now, we would need to apply another layer. So 10 years or more, all those binding sites will be used up and then you would apply another um, application. So I think that's my last slide, if there are questions. That's awesome, thanks, Megan. Megan, let me see if I might kick this off first. So when we do the first treatment on upper prior, can you talk about what percentage of the alum is bound up on a, say, year one, and then what percentage does it grow to in year two, year three, year four? Can you give us a sense of how that evolves? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think this is where um, we have a lot of empirical evidence from past treatments. So there's probably not a direct measurement or understanding of that, but with 10 year effectiveness, uh, the idea and some, some alum treatments last well beyond that is we, we wanna have kind of a slow, gradual, um, uh, um, basically, uh, you know, consumption or, you know, using up all of those binding sites by phosphate. And, you know, assuming too also that some of those binding sites just start to, you know, be lost over time. So it would be a good rule of thumb to assume that, you know, it's maybe losing five to 10% every year. I mean, if, if we're thinking of it as total number of binding sites and that it's gonna last 10 years. So, kind of estimate. but it should be a gradual kind of filling up of those binding sites. So let me clarify. So we we do our dosage in 2020. Are you telling mm -hmm. me that in the first year, only 5% of all the alum that we have put in upper prior will be bound with phosphorus? Is that correct? Correct. The idea is to have an alum flock layer where you have binding sites available as phosphate is released on an annual basis from the lake sediments. So gotcha. 
yeah, phosphate gets released slowly and every year, you know, we kind of look at an average annual internal load. So we get new sources every year from those lake sediments. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anybody else at this point? Um, this is Bruce and Kurt. Um, the, five, the 571 number in our agreement with Bowser, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, we have to, we have to do some core samples to show that we're reducing that amount of phosphorus a year, or how does that work? Let's still yeah, so that's a, that's a good question too. So the, so we look at total phosphorus loads to lakes kind of in a, in a, you know, entire budget. So we have watershed sources, we have upstream sources and the internal sources. And so we can make an estimate of we see um, an average concentration of phosphorus of um, a certain amount. And it's due to so much coming from watershed and so much from internal load. And we can put that to pounds per year. So 571 was essentially what we determined was coming from the sediments on average. With alum, since it acts as a flock layer that you know basically is using up that phosphate as it gets released, when we apply the alum, even within that first year, we should see an immediate, you know, uh, treatment of the internal load. So it has binding sites available. So it's it's not a direct measurement like you could monitor a stream flowing into a lake and and determine how much less phosphorus is coming from. But basically, um, if you have an alum treatment and it's effective, those that flock layer is intact. You basically would assume that it is. Kind of treating all of that excess internal load and then over time you're, you're losing the effectiveness so by about year 10 you're starting to see that you have more internal load and you would start to add that back into your lake budget because there's no binding sites left so that phosphorus would release into the, the bottom waters again uh, just one more question how many mm -hmm. cores do samples do you have to take to show um the phosphorus level being you know bound up per year do you have to take quite a few uh you know it's good to get some of your kind of key characteristic areas so you know a range of depths if there's a, a, a distinctive bay you might want one core from there and i would say the cores would mainly be used to see where your flock layer is and how much you know phosphorus is accumulated on top but another good measure too is just your surface water quality and, and just looking at bottom water phosphorus concentrations as well to see if you're getting build up over the summer in your bottom water. Okay, but thank you. Look at distinct basins, the deep points, um, maybe the deepest point in certain bays or certain areas. And upper prior lake, of course, is very um, complex. So there, there's that's why more cores are taken and you would want to look at different areas. Mm -hmm. Charlie, Kurt, anybody else? Well, I don't have any. Nope. Awesome. Well, thank you, Megan. I appreciate it. Very nice to meet you, and thanks for uh, joining us today. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. So it looks like as a time check right now, we're about five minutes to six or just shy of that. I don't know if folks have uh, had a chance to take a quick bio break, but uh, I'm wondering if we take a short break, let people hit the restroom, and then we come back and sort of reconvene at six. Does that sound reasonable? Uh, could we do 10 minutes? Five minutes is really short. <laughs> okay, 10 minutes it is. Okay. That sound good, everyone? 10 minute break? Reconvene at five after six? Yep. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, everybody.
Hello again. Diane, are you with us? Bruce, Charlie, Kurt? Yes. Yep. I just want to show that Kurt is here. <laughs> Hello. Hello, world. Hi, Kurt. <laughs> Mike, Mike, I'm gonna I'm gonna try again Thursday. I I I, I signed up for the cooperatives meeting to just uh um, he's having trouble getting in, so he's got to do a couple of trials. Uh, I'm going to try it again Thursday see if I can get into the cooperative yeah. as an observer. I told him he might have broke his camera when it looked at him. Yeah, well, that could be. <laughs> <laughs> That's very likely. <laughs> I see. Carl, you're back. Diane, are you here? You're muted, Diane. Diane? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute everybody and I'm gonna give Diane a buzz. I'm gonna go see if I can catch her. Hello, all. Well, I just tried to reach Diane and was unsuccessful. I'm here. Oh, I had okay. to pick two cats and two dogs and grab something for myself. So that's pretty fast. <laughs> okay. That it is. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's get this party started. So I'm going to officially call the Tuesday, May 12, 2020, Prior Lake Spring Lake Watershed District Board of Managers meeting to order. And our first order of business, and I, I don't think we did this last time. Kurt, I'm still going to ask you, sir, would you please um, lead us in a Pledge of Allegiance? And hopefully you all have a flag. Kurt, go for it, sir. Here we go. I pledge allegiance <laughs> to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic which is one nation, one nation under, under God. God. Awesome. Thank you, Kurt. So our next item on the agenda is the public comment. And for that, I would look to see if there is anybody here from the public who I don't see anybody in attendance, um, but I'm still just going to give it the official opening to see if anybody wishes to speak. Seeing none, we're going to move on to the approval of the agenda. And I will first of all ask my colleagues and Diane if there are any uh, modifications to the agenda this evening. Diane, anything on your side? Uh, Mr. Chair, no, but I would like to ask people to identify who is on the call. Because I see uh, a couple people that I don't recognize. So if, if people could, besides the managers, I know that they're there. But I, I uh, see someone that says T, and I don't know who that is. Oh, I couldn't see that. Yeah. Um, it says that there are eight people on the call right now. Uh, T is Terry. Oh, it's Terry. Okay, okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's just Jamie, Bruce, Carl, Catherine, Maggie, myself, and, and Charlie. Okay, great. So I, think, um, I know Jim Winnegar was supposed to be on representing the CAC. And uh, I know that he's been given that information. And Liz called me while we were on the call for the workshop, which of course I couldn't get. But um, I emailed her the information. I don't know if he's going to join us or not, but uh, okay, he might be joining us later. Okay, so back on the agenda, then I'm going to ask any of my colleagues uh, if there are any additions or deletions to the agenda. 
Were you on, were you no. online for the last no. CAC meeting? We're here. Sure. Uh, no, no, none for me. None for okay. me. Okay, so seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Motion to approve the agenda. The agenda. By Kurt. Second. Second by Bruce. Thank you. Um, we're going to do a roll call vote. Charlie, how do you vote? Aye. Bruce, how do you vote? Aye. Kurt, thank you. Or, aye. Sorry, Kurt. <laughs> and aye. Mike votes aye. It passes. Thanks, Thanks Chance. Um, okay, so we're on to other old new business. Meg, um, Diane and yes. team, we will turn this back to you. Right, I will turn the, uh, this over to Jamie for, I'll make her the presenter. Here we go. Okay, I am here. And can everybody see that, the screen? The uh, yes. Alan Barge? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, programs and projects. Uh, Prior Lake is actually almost um, down to 902.5. It should stop flowing in, um, well, I would say a couple days, but we do have a little bit of rain coming tomorrow, so maybe not, but um, it's been a while. So I got my first um, email from a concerned citizen about the low water levels, wondering if we had the low flow gate open and was concerned why the water was <laughs> so low. So it's been a really long time since I've gotten that concern. Um, you can see Spring Lake is also um, on its way down that elevation, um, although we don't really compare it to much, is not um, exactly right yet because the DNR hasn't surveyed it in, but um, it is representing the actual decline in water level accurately. Um, so, the alum treatment, as I think most of you know, is um, on its way in Spring Lake. It's almost, or it's over halfway done now and um, should be done uh, this weekend or maybe a little bit sooner. We've been out monitoring the water every day that they're out treating. Um, we monitor pH to make sure that it doesn't get too acidic. But um, it's really, um, everybody, it's not a concern that this would happen in Spring Lake, I guess, because there's such a large volume of water, but um, <clears throat> we do still have to go out and make sure that everything's in order. They they did some jar testing, and one of the tests that they do is if they dumped in all the alum at one time into the lake, if that would put the pH um, like at a too acidic of a, a level for the fish and have a fish kill. but even if it all went in at one time, according to their jar tests, um, it would still be at an acceptable level. So that's kind of nice to know. Uh, let's see, Upper Prior, uh, the work plan has been approved and we're just waiting on a signed contract with Bowser and um, everything is still in order for treating this spring. Diane, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? the upper prior no um i just checked yesterday to see if the contract was in e-link and it wasn't yet but they usually send an email telling you that it's there so i will check with the board conservationist uh probably tomorrow because he told me last week that it was that he approved the work plan so it's okay. probably they just backed up a little bit okay Curly leaf pondweed treatment. So this, um, actually, this is the map of the treatment areas that Steve McComas with Blue Water Science delineated for us based off of his surveys that he did on April 30th. So um, they're a little bit hard to see with all the dots, but basically where you see a number, that's a treatment zone. And um, all the little dots are where he did tests. So. A red dot means that it's heavy growth. And then 
Um, you can see in that table, all of the acres together added up to 24 acres with upper and lower Prior Lake combined. They did actually just treat this today. So that's done. Jamie, before you leave that slide, could you go back a sec, please? So what I wanted to ask about is in Mud Bay, and it was maybe a week or two, uh, probably two weeks ago, there was actually what looked like a bunch of um, cut curly leaf. Did that have anything to do? I don't know if somebody was cutting, but it was um, covered much of Mud Bay. Is that part of anything Steve does? Uh, nope. Um, it, does it look like it was actually mowed or could it have been from boats driving through it? That it you, did you see like the pieces floating around or it? Yeah. Sorry, pieces floating around. Correct. Um, I, I personally haven't been in there, but I know Jeff Anderson had sent me a picture of like some pretty heavy growth in there that it was close to the surface. So it yeah. might possibly be that boat propellers were um, driving through it and chopping it up, but we haven't done anything like with a mechanical harvester or anything of that nature. So if that was done, it wasn't us. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Spring Lake uh, also was delineated and there were four different areas which totaled um, almost 15 acres to be treated and that will be treated on Friday. I did double check with the alum contractor to make sure um, that this was okay and he has already treated those areas and the contractor with the herbicide for the curly leaf pondweed said, you know, there's no harm in, in mixing those two chemicals. So uh, that should be done this Friday. Also last week we started the boat inspections looking for aquatic invasive species. We hired water guards to do this. Um, they're manning Spring Lake, Upper Prior Lake, and Lower Prior Lake boat launches. Um, currently they have four inspectors approved and they're looking to get one more. There was a bit of a delay due to COVID-19 and all that, but um, the fifth person, person should be on board by this weekend. They are, um, we are having the lakes inspected Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Eventually it's gonna be shared with the DNR, but the DNR has not been approved to be out inspecting these boat launches yet. So um, up until that happens, Water Guards is going to uh, pick up their slack what, uh, when and where they can. So they'll be out there from approximately 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. on those lakes. And it looks like it's Maggie's slide. <laughs> you can go ahead and go to the next one, Jamie. Uh, so we've just been really busy uh, with carp management activities. Um, we've been out tracking the carp with both pit tag stations, installing those, and also those radio tags that we track with the boat. Um, and we've also been doing um, an installation of cameras at various locations around um, the watershed to keep an eye on where they're spawning so we can go in and get them when they are. And if you go to the next slide. Uh, so we finished up our gale netting project. So this was a series of four separate efforts. In all four efforts, we only caught one native fish. It was a pike. Um, unfortunately, it was accidentally released because that's normally what you do when you seine, and the fishermen were used to doing that, so they just accidentally threw it back. So we don't have a survival rate on that, but the DNR was very pleased to see that the, the net size was right. It was large enough where those native fish were going through and we were only catching those large carp. Um, so this project will be used to hopefully get the permission to be gill netting under, under the ice when we get to that point in the winter and also use it as a supplementary tool, both in spring and fall. Uh, and if you go to the next slide. Oh, oops. <clears throat> looks oh, like yeah. there's a video. <laughs> yeah. See, if you go to the next slide. Um, and then we had that Spring Lake Sane event on April 24th. So we used a variety of tools. So this 
carp weren't where we wanted them to be. And so we used a big block net. So we tied three 500 foot block nets together to kind of make them go where we wanted to go, set that up first. We also put um, gill nets um, against areas near the cattails that we did not want them to go. And then we used our speakers. So we kind of did um, a three round punch on getting the carp to go where we wanted. And to our delight, it definitely worked. And we were able to um, get them into the seine nets um, on the west side of Spring Lake. And so we caught about 5,000 pounds. We do suspect that some escaped as we were trying to work around that woody shoreline that you can see there. Um, but we still consider it a pretty big success now that we know that this tool can work. Um, and I'm sure most of you have heard, but the fish were taken by a buffalo farm down in Elko. So it was a really short distance away and we were lucky to find them in a quick short notice. So if you go to the next slide, Uh, we've also been continuing with like these little micro haul events. Uh, we did an electrofishing effort in Mud Bay a couple times. We've also been using it as a supplementary tool when we're doing the gill netting. And we just continue to use this, um, this tool. And uh, that's just a picture of Jeff getting them in the boat. Um, and if you go to the next slide after that, uh, the thing that we've been really trying to get into place before the fish spawn in a week or two here is these specialized traps. So at the last board meeting, we showed you the push trap that we've been working on, um, and that's located over the desilt pond. But then just yesterday, we put in this other specialized trap, and you can kind of see it in the middle of the net. So what it is, is it's a big box trap. So the net is laid over the ground, and then the sides come up like you can see there. And in the middle, you can kind of see it, there's like a throat of mesh net, so the fish are trying to figure out a way to get to that Arctic Lake outlet on Upper Prior Lake. And the only way they can move forward is into this net that gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's like a little throat and it kind of guides the fish in there. And then it gets to the point where it can't move backward. It can only go forward and it ends up trapping itself in this net. And this is something that um, we're kind of basing it off somebody else's design. With okay, some it's on now. And, uh, so hopefully we'll catch a bunch that are trying to go upstream to spawn. It's a way that we can passively it's um, on. capture fish. Jamie, and so, Jamie's Jamie presenting. Okay. Okay. So it's set up right now. And everything's uh, happy, happy. Yep. I'm smiling. Okay, thanks. I could say, hey, okay. somebody's on um got their mic on. Could you please turn your mic on so we can hear Maggie? I think Can Chris turn the mic your mic off? on. Yes, yeah. we need to have you turn your mics off so they're muted. Yeah, Chris, could you please turn your mic off? Okay, I think we're good. All right, thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, so this is set up over by the Arctic Lake outlet right off of Mud Bay. And uh, we're hoping to capture a lot of carp. We do have a camera set up here so that we can keep an eye at it all the time and we can see if carp are moving in. We also have a camera set up over by the push trap to make sure that's functioning properly. And Jeff Anderson, who um, was the designer for the uh, push trap over by the desilt pond, he's been making some modifications. So we're kind of learning as we go. Um, and this trap that you see in front of you, this is called, we're calling it the Newman trap um, after Mary Newman from WSB who helped design it. Um, this can double as a box trap. So we'll be taking off that throat that I just kind of described before and using it as a box, baited box trap with volunteers later this summer. So it's kind of a dual functioning trap. And this will only stay up there for like about another four to six weeks, depending on how, um, how long the carp are spawning for, and then we'll remove it from that area. And so the pike and the walleye, they've already spawned. So this isn't gonna affect their migration routes or their fish behavior. And this is really just targeting in on those carp. Um, and uh, I should mention too, if anybody's watching from home, like we could definitely use some um, volunteers to help with the baited box traps in June. Um, we're gonna be doing it as contactless as possible, but we'll need help with people going out once a day to drop corn in certain areas of Upper Prior Lake and Spring Lake. And I think that's it, but Jamie, do you want to go to the next slide just in case? Oh, next steps, yes. 
So um, we're going to be checking on those um, traps that on Spring and Upper Prior Lake. Um, like I said before, we're going to be doing baited box traps using volunteers starting around mid-June. We're going to be doing micro hauls with our smaller um, gill nets that we can use, as well as all of the electric fishing boat and our box um, or our block nets. Uh, we'll be tracking those pit tags and radio tags, and we're still scheduled for stocking bluegills. The water temperature just isn't getting warm enough quite yet, so we're just kind of waiting on that. But as soon as that happens, then the, the next week or two, we're going to be stocking those bluegills. And that's it. Do you guys have any questions about the carp stuff? Thanks, Maggie. Um, let me just kick it off. But so, Maggie, I know you know we you tried a number of potential open water sands also early on in the season, and I'm sure they haven't been as successful as you'd like. Can I'm going to assume number one can maybe confirm that the the opportunity to continue to do open water sands is now done, and then could you maybe also just comment on the what is it you do different uh, to make those successful next year? Or is there something you can do to increase the success rate next year? Sure. Um, so Mr. Chair, managers, so the commercial fishermen can only use their really large seine nets um, from the day after Labor Day until the day before fishing and opener. So right now we're in this period of not being able to seine. So, um, so yeah, so we're kind of just doing the micro hauls and smaller efforts that don't affect the um, the fishing by residents or other people. So, uh, so yeah, so we're kind of in a standing period as far as staining goes until next fall. And yeah, so the the stains are, you know, it truly is fishing. Like you can't guarantee success, and you just keep trying different things and adapting and try, try again. So we were really surprised and pleased to see that our efforts to move the fish on the Spring Lake Hall worked. Um, you know, there's some hard spots with that woody debris. Um, and uh, trying to find a landing spot is important, like one that's not by the cattails, that's not our own woody stuff. And on Spring Lake, where they like to go, it's just um, there's not a good landing spot. There is on Kurt's side on the east side of Spring Lake, but um, it's muddy and it's hard to pull the net through and it's hard to be successful there. So we're just kind of continuing to adapt and work with the fishermen and, um, but we're really happy to see that that haul worked out. So we're probably gonna use something similar next year. Um, only we might try to clear a landing area before we do it, <laughs> if we can without spooking the fish. But now that we know we can move them that far, we can try to something a little bit different there. And then as far as Upper Prior Lake, it's just incredibly challenging because the lake is smaller than Spring Lake, but there's so many little twists and turns and you can't herd the fish quite as well. So we're still talking to those commercial fishermen. So we are very fortunate to have three commercial fishermen that have come out to our lakes multiple times. There are watersheds that can't even get one, but we've had three. So using their expertise and um, learning with them during this process has been really great. So we just continue to get better and better at that. But um, yeah, I wish it was, uh, we were getting uh, more success with that, but we're just gonna push forward, continue to try new things and use the commercial fishermen for their expertise and rely on them and the tools that we have to do better and better. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Good. Kurt wants to say something. Kurt, Mike, I, I've got a, I've got a question. Maggie, um, are you guys? Do you guys have a uh, program set up, a plan to um, look through the bottom of those high uh, carp areas, like uh, across some sailors on Spring Lake and over by me? Are you are you going to case out all them? Uh, lake bombs to make sure there's no uh, uh, debris or um, branches or floating wood or old rocks that could uh, hook uh, the singer's uh, nets again this winter? Uh, Mr. Chair, Manager Hennis, yeah, we definitely are. It's, it's kind of like this strange uh, game too because the people who put the Christmas trees out um, that are weighted with blocks, they either put it out in the 
you know, like at the end of the winter, hoping that they're just going to fall through the ice and land where they want, or they put them out right before winter. And that's what the commercial fishermen were saying was that they see people put in these um, trees for fish cribs, um, usually very, very late in the fall. And so we were talking about strategy around that because we don't want to, you know, um, stain it too soon, like, or like run the, um, the lead lines through there to see if it catches anything too soon. So we're just talking about strategies around that. I think we're going to rely heavily on um, WSB's new technology, this hummingbird sonar that does a really good job of mapping out the lake bottom, potentially getting one of our own so we can do a bunch of sweeps to make sure that we're not missing anything. And then, like you said, just, you know, running that lead line or chain through the bottom in those areas that we know we want to pull the net through in in the fall before the ice. Um, but yeah, so we're going to continue to do that. We can't obviously clear the whole lake and we can't anticipate what people are going to do, but we do our best. So that's our plan. So Maggie, let me do a follow up on that. What about actually then doing some of the education stuff as well to work with the Spring Lake Association and or current landowners? I'm assuming we've got a listing of all the property owners to send them some informational pieces and maybe uh, dip into Catherine's social media stuff to help people understand the negative impacts of putting in the trees as cribs. Uh, Mr. Chair, that's a great idea. Actually, we do have it in our grant to do an outreach effort to landowners for the aquatic vegetation, um, just alerting them that that it will improve and to please, you know, not remove all of it. But we can definitely include some education in there as well about please don't put <laughs> Christmas trees in the bottom of Spring Lake. Um, so yeah, that's that's a great point, and I'll definitely be working with Catherine on that. Thanks. I have, I have one more question, Mike. Maggie, Go ahead. If, if you would need someone to visually kind of watch over that area on the north north end of uh, northwest end of Spring Lake, right prior to the uh, the freeze over, kind of watching that stuff, I could visually go by there, you know, every other day for uh, several weeks if that would help. If you just let me know, I could do that. Okay. Well, Mr. Chair, Manager Hennis, yeah, that would be great. I mean, any eyes and ears out there, anybody, um, I don't know who's listening to this meeting even, who would want to report anything that they're seeing for CARP or that would affect our CARP activities, that would be fantastic. Charlie, anything, any questions from you or Bruce? No. I'm good. Awesome. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, we're on to the next item on our agenda, and that's the acceptance of our 2019 audit. Yes. Yeah, so, Annie, yeah. go ahead. Uh, Andy, do you uh, want me to turn, do you have something to present to show them or um, yeah, not? Could, um, I can share my screen right now. It's grayed out, so. Yep, I will, I will give it to you, just a minute. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to make you the presenter right now. There you go. <clears throat> okay, Andy, you are muted though. Unmute your speaker. There you go. All right. Now everyone can see my screen. Um, yeah. So, Diane, did you want to do any introduction, should or should I just start out with the presentation? Well, I guess for our public, um, Abda Weika Myers is our official auditor for two years, and they've just completed the 2019 uh, financial audit. Uh, they spent a couple of days at the office um, in March, right before we closed, and uh, worked with staff as well as managers to uh, check in on a number of things that we did in 2019 to make sure it was clear on all of that. And then he worked uh, with Chris Shadow quite a bit as well to make sure that uh, what uh, we were doing in accounting was jiving with what was happening in the audit. So go ahead, Andy. All right, thank you very much, Diane. Um, I'm Andy Berg with Abdo Eichemeyers, like Diane mentioned, and I will go through the presentation of the 
2019 financial statement audit. So what I'll cover, I'll go over our audit opinion. Um, we'll take a look at the district financials as a whole. We'll look at each of your, your funds, starting with the general fund and then your other governmental funds, your JPA, MOA funds, and your debt service fund. So the, the end result of our audit is that we issue an opinion on your financial statements. We should an unmodified opinion or clean opinion, so the best opinion you can get. Uh, pleased to announce the, the good opinion and that that, that went well. We definitely appreciate all the work um, staff goes through and getting us all the information and items we need to look at to get the audit done. As part of the audit, we also test a number of different Minnesota legal compliance areas. In that report, we do um, issue one finding that was similar to last year. As part of your uh, purchases and disbursements, under state statutes, you're required to retain uh, receipts or documentation for um, those disbursements, expenses. Uh, we did test one month of credit card purchases and noticed a couple um, purchases did not have supporting invoices. So we were required to report that as a legal compliance finding. Now moving into the, the financial information, uh, like I mentioned, we'll look at the district as a whole and then also each of the funds. So starting here is uh, the summary statement of net position of the district as a whole. Uh, so basically your balance sheet. Uh, you had total assets of about 3.4 million with the majority of that in cash and temporary investments. Total liabilities of just over 1.2 million uh, with about 590,000 of that being current liabilities and about 667 being non-current liabilities, your bonds payable and your net pension liability. Uh, basically the difference between assets and liabilities is your net position, which ended the year at 2.1 million um, into three different categories, investment and capital assets at about 813,000, uh, restricted net position, about 401,000, which is made up of your two JPA MOA funds, which we'll look at, and then unrestricted 926,000. So jumping into each of the individual funds, first with your general fund, here we give you a five-year history of your ending general fund balance, which is indicated by the blue line. You'll see it's increased um, since 2017. The end of 2019, it increased to just over 300,000. If we compare that to your next year's budget, so your 2020 budget, uh, that equals about 136% compared to the budget of about 226,000. On the next slide, we'll look at the, the activity of the general fund. So how do we get to that uh, fund balance, just over 300,000? So total revenues came in at about 204,000, fairly close to budget, uh, $3,600 budget variance. Expenditures were under budget by about 84,000. So total expenditures at 117,000. So that was the main reason for the increase in the budget or the fund balance of 87,000 ending at 306,000. So the next fund we'll look at is your implementation fund. Um, here you had total revenue about 1.5 million, total expenditures of just over 1 million, so revenues over expenditures of 497,000. You transferred out to the JPA MOA fund about 26,000. So the total fund balance increased about 471,000. Uh, the main reason for that was levying for uh, future alum treatments. And then some of the other revenue expenditure variances are based on timing of projects and the related grant revenue. So total fund balance in the implementation fund ending at just over 1.2 million. You do have um, one debt service fund. At the end of the year, you had uh, outstanding bonds of 350,000. Uh, with original maturity date of 2021, which you did pay off in February of 2020. So this fund um, is closed out as of current. And then your 
remaining two funds are your two JPA MOA funds. You have the operations fund and your emergency fund. The operations fund ending fund balance uh, decreased 69,000, um, ending at 141,000. The emergency fund uh, decreased about 4,000, ending at 260,000. So you did have, um, going through the operations fund, you had about 640,000 of expenses during the year, uh, mainly funded by uh, FEMA, and there is a receivable at the end of the year of about 631,000. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that anyone has on the, the presentation or the actual financial statements. Great, thank you, Andy. Colleagues, I'll let you start. Any questions? Um, Kurt's got one. Diane, Mike, I've got a question. Um, when do we have any idea when we're gonna get the, the rest of the money that FEMA owes us, that $600,000? Is there any ballpark time we're looking at for that? No, I don't know. <clears throat> um, we're gonna be wrapping up the bank erosion project within the next week. And then I will be doing, I did a closeout of all the other projects, but I'll be doing a closeout of the bank erosion project. Um, and I have sent Wayne Lamoureux, and this is well over a year that we have uh, bills that haven't been paid, um, a request a couple of times, also send it to his boss. Um, and I will, I will do my best to get a hold of him to see what he can give us as a prognosis, uh, because this is ridiculous. As you might recall, we had that DNR so-called grant to help us with the cost of the bank erosion. And because we had a number of challenges getting that project going, the DNR said, well, you know, we weren't really comfortable with this grant anyway, so we want it back. And so they made us pay back. I think we owed about 100000 at that point. We had to pay that back. And so we lost the grant because they said, well, you know, FEMA pays within 30 days anyways. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, I unfortunately, I don't know, but um, I will do my best to try to get it going. And I suppose <clears throat> we could actually even ask our legislators to help us with that if we need to. Uh, one more quick question. Uh, Mike, um, as far as closing out the um, the uh, project, are, are you talking about grass seeding along the embankments? Is that what the closeout is? Yes, uh, they had to do the erosion and sed sediment control. They had to pull some of the um, uh, erosion control blanket that was plastic. It wasn't supposed to be plastic. And then actually doing the seeding and taking care of uh, like grading some of the areas, the ruts from the equipment, et cetera. So um, most of that has been done. I think they're just um, going to be finishing up on the seating, as I recall, like next week. And then I'll be getting, it will have to walk, walk through all the segments again to make sure that they're ready. And uh, then I'll be pulling all the bills together for FEMA. All right. Mike, I just have one question. Yeah, go Bruce. For, for Andy, um, the term unearned revenue, it just strikes me as kind of an oxymoron. Can you explain that to what that really is, unearned revenue? So that's uh, money that you received in from the, the other members of the JPA MOA that you haven't spent yet. So really it's cash you received. And rather than being recognized as revenue right now, because you haven't spent it yet, it's sitting as unearned revenue as a liability. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Is that it, Bruce? Yep, that's it. Charlie? Yeah, hey, I got one question. Um, on these um, compliance tests that you do as part of your audit, and we failed two years in a row on a credit card deal. Would we be out of line to say that you're gonna test again for that next year or is it completely random what tests that you do? We'll be testing for that again next year because the, the state auditor puts um, together the different Minnesota legal compliance that we test and my guess is they're not gonna remove 
some of that credit card testing. We may not, like this year we selected one month, we'll probably select a different month next year. We also do a, a random disbursement test too, where something like that could show up. So we select, let's say 25 disbursements that aren't necessarily purchased by credit card. Um, so there's some randomness to the test, but my guess is those tests will still be in the legal compliance guides that the state auditor puts together. So, Mr. Chair, can I can I respond to that or please, please do? Sure. Yeah, because yeah, I was going to ask a yeah. question on this too, and okay. you might be answering it. So go for it. <laughs> okay. Well, um, as Andy said and and Charlie said, it came up last year, and what we did is we instituted a, a paper trail, basically. A staff has to fill out a form that um, gets permission from me to have a visa statement and then the receipt is attached to that form and it's given to Amy and so we have tightened up quite a bit but obviously we didn't tight up, tighten up enough and I had a conversation with Andy about how to deal with this because it's it's a challenge uh, with several different people charging things and not hanging on to their receipts and what he suggested, and uh, this is what I'm considering doing right now, is that if we don't have all the receipts accounted for in a month, so like let's say this month, um, Amy and I have gone through them all and we've asked staff to turn in everything and it actually is complete. It's 100%, we have all the receipts. If we do not have 100% of the receipts, we're not paying the visa bill. And I don't think we have to worry about our credit standing, but what we have to worry about as staff, that means we can't charge anything unless we've paid the bill off. So um, that is the, you know, the the uh, process that I'm putting in place. Uh, I guess the more drastic method would be just simply that I'm the only one that can use the credit card and they have to ask me to to find something and charge it. Um, we have talked about um, staff having individual credit cards, and some of my colleagues actually do that um, because you know exactly who's responsible for the receipt. But on the other hand, that means it's kind of a nightmare. There's all these credit cards out there that you have to make sure that you have receipts for. Um, and then also, I think that I would lose a little bit of the check and balance piece because if it's easy if, if they have a credit card they can just charge it without checking with me first so um there there is a another process that andy pointed out you can actually go to your bank and have individual credit cards similar to that uh, but I, I believe under the umbrella of the district's credit card uh, that's a possibility as well but yeah uh, the staff knows how important this is and that we really can't have that show up for a third time. Charlie, did you have any more to follow up on that? Because since Diane was talking about it, I would end up asking. Yeah, I got I got one more thing. Um, but I mean, on these credit card charges? It, yeah, related. Okay, then, then go, you got the floor, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if this is for Andy or Chris. Does this, compliance report finding, whether it's one year or two years in a row, would that have any effect on our bond rating if we needed to go get bonds? My my guess is that it's probably not gonna, wouldn't have effect on it because in the grand scheme of things from a, a financial standpoint, it really doesn't affect it. And I think he could explain a, a way to the, the bonding rating agencies that it's really not that significant i mean it the there were two receipts missing out of 41 for a total of 80 dollars. i can't imagine a bond rating agency is going to care about that good that's good to hear um and staying on on bonds if we don't we closed out we paid off our bonds and let's say we don't need to or want to um or we don't end up going after new bonds for say five more years is not having bonds a reflect a reflection on our bond rating or would our whatever our current rating is stay the same for the next time we do want to go after some bonds i think it would um i don't think it would negatively affect your your bond rating 
I think they'd still look at the the history and some of your projections of where your fund balances are, how you've been um, paying for your projects and that kind of stuff when they go to rate you. So I don't I don't know 100%, but I don't think just because you don't issue bonds, I don't think that would negatively affect you. And then last question on that, sorry, <clears throat> frog in my throat, um, Carl, it's catching. Um, if we were to have cash flow issues and somehow you know get a line of credit from our from our bank, for example, is that a negative thing from a, a bond rating perspective, or does that have no impact? I think they'd look at that and look at the reasons of why you're getting it, wh where you're having cash flow issues. So I think it would depend on the circumstances uh, to how they see that. Okay, thanks. That's all I got, Mike. So, Charlie, um, I'm going to ask you one first. What's got you thinking about that question, that last one? Uh, not getting our FEMA money okay. could potentially cause some cash flow issues down the road. Even with the bonds that we currently have that we could call or, you know, turn in, I mean? Yeah, potentially, because you got to combine that with if 50% of the people don't pay their property tax, that means we only get 50% of our money. Yeah, now well, I there's, heard there's some risk out there, and so that's why I started generating these questions about future borrowing if we had yep. to. Okay, so and we can come back to that because I'd like to. Um, anyway, yeah, let, let me come back to that. So, Andy, if I may, and maybe it's even Di actually probably Diane. Um, so, Diane, as I understand it, um, this test on the credit cards was a single month that they pulled, but clearly. Um, and this happened also last year in a single month polled, and that we are finding charges. I was gonna ask about the size of the charge, which Andy, you've given me comfort that it wasn't uh, material necessarily, but still it would even suggest if this is just a test, this is occurring probably more than an individual month and that, that maybe we do have a problem. I'm curious to know, and I don't need the name, is there an individual employee or is this more broadly systemic in the issue of, of you know, is it one individual or it's all staff are not, are respond, aren't, aren't all turning in receipts? Well, the two uh, receipts that were unaccounted for, I re recall, was one was for Cub Foods and one was Holiday, which is gas and, and food. So... You know, we have several people using the truck and getting gas with the credit card. So that one is really hard to tell. Um, the the food, you know, it's basically we get food for meetings and we get food for um, board meetings um, sometimes. Um, so that would be people that are, oh, and also farmer-led council meetings. So that would be people that are purchasing food um, for different events. Again. But is this it, so it's systemic it, it's systemic i think so i'm going to encourage you not to not please don't not pay the bill and we're incurring interest rates to to deal with the problem with staff so um not getting receipts i'd i'd support you doing something else i'd love to i mean while generally i'm gonna on the positive note most of this stuff was clean and it appears there's just some small issues but just uh because these are public dollars um, so first of all, kudos for the vast majority of this, Diane, nice, nicely done. But um, it does look like we have a little problem here and we'd love to not see this come up. So I'll leave it at that and go for it. Figure out the path to to do this. But because um, again, these aren't these aren't our dollars, right? Right. Um, so then, Andy, you know, the only thing I know you do these um, audits, and so my question really isn't a, uh, most of the audit when I looked at it all looked fine, sir. Thank you. Um, but I was more curious on anything that you note that looks to how our audits or our financial position compares as better or worse than other districts. Uh, anything that sort of stands out in, in to put this in context for us on our watershed versus any others. Yeah, you know, I think your, um, you know, the operations and how you're funded are, are very similar. You know, other watersheds we work with and their implementation fund, 
you know, they levy and build up the reserves for plan projects going out. A lot of the projects are grant funded. The the difference um, from yours is you have the JPA MOA included in there. You don't see that. So that's something unique. I don't different, which I guess is fairly obvious with that. Um, the large receivable from FEMA, you know, I think that's something to to pay attention to and you know, could be a, a cash flow issue, but knowing some FEMA grants out there, that's probably not uncommon that sometimes they take a while to collect on. But otherwise, you know, I think a lot of comparable activities, you know, your your fund balance reserves are um, out there. Most watershed districts have um, reserves for future projects like them. So looking pretty normal then is what I'm sort of hearing. Correct. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Andy. I think we then uh, we're looking for a motion to um, to accept the 2019 audit. So moved, Charlie. By Charlie. Second. Second by Kurt. Roll call vote. Of course, of course uh, Charlie. How do you vote, sir? Aye. Bruce, how do you vote? Aye. Kurt, how do you vote? Aye. Mike is also an I. That passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Thanks again, Andy, for your time and joining us this evening. Thank you very much. So we're on to the next item on number 4.3, the approval of a new CAC member, Chris Crowhurst. Diane, do you have a, an intro you'd like to do before we say hello to Chris? Yeah. I know he joined us. Yes, Chris joined us, and we are delighted to have a new member to our um, CAC and actually Catherine is here, right? Catherine, do you want to introduce him? There she is. Since this is an introduction, I'm going to put my video on. <laughs> I'm not Chris. sure if Catherine's microphone is working. Oh. She's talking, but we can't hear her. <laughs> Diane, maybe you do the introduction. Or I can introduce myself, that's fine. Because they're both speaking now without us being able to hear them. Did any occur? Yeah. No, we can't, Catherine. Chris, it may be on you sir, to introduce yourself. Catherine. Looks like it's on myself, yes. So um, my name is Christopher Crowhurst. I'm an expat Brit, lived in the US for uh, 30 years now, uh, the last 15 of them in Minnesota. Um, I've owned a home on Spring Lake for about 12 years with my wife, Jacqueline. Um, we are avid. Um, outdoor enthusiasts, predominantly um, sea kayaking, which we carry out on the Great Lakes as well as on our local lakes. Um, I'm the, uh, the past president of the Inland Sea Kayakers Association, which is the Twin Cities Sea Kayaking Association with about 300 members in the Twin Cities, as well as Kayak USA, which is the national organization for sea kayakers across the US. Um, I have been introduced to really the lake and also to the organizations by Christian Mockerberg, who I think you're probably many of you are familiar with. Um, Christian and I spearheaded some of the legal um, battle is a strong word, but the, the legal action that we took to help um, constrain the construction that's taking um, place on Spring Lake shortly. Um, and through that work, Christian introduced me to the work of the CAC um, and felt that it matched with my passion for ecology, um, plant life, and animal life. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of interesting. Christian has a, pa a passion for the animals. I have a passion for the plants. Um, and we meet in the middle and support each other as much as we can. So uh, in my time at Spring Lake, I've seen the water conditions change dramatically, the, the, um, the, the life, the aquatic life, as well as the plant life. Um, and it might sound strange, but as a sea kayaker, I spend a lot of time upside down in that lake. Um, I actually teach people to roll, which is the, the technique of going upside down and then self-rescuing yourself. And I've taught 
about 300 people to roll on Spring Lake. And it's a pretty disgusting thing to do because that water condition, um, by the time the, the water warms up, is, is not a fun place to be. So it gives you great motivation to come up, but it gives me a lot of motivation to get that lake as clean and as healthy and as uh, back to its original state as we can. So I would just like to contribute whatever um, mental and physical effort I can to support the great work that you are all doing. Um, and I appreciate you considering my nomination to the CAC. Very happy to answer any questions anyone has about my background. Well, awesome. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate you uh, joining this ragged band of folks who do care about our water um, quality, quantity, and the resources in the district. So anybody, any, any questions of Chris at this point? Uh, hey, I'm, Mike, I have a question. I live on, I live on Spring Lake, Christopher. So I'm, uh, and I see on your application, you talked about you've been impacted by flooding. Where, where on Spring Lake do you live, sir? So I am um, three houses along from the public boat ramp on the south side. Um, so one of the 1920 ramblers that, that is down there. Um, we have a crawl space that is effectively um, at the water table. Um, it's an unfinished crawl space. During the last major incident, I forget the year, it was very recent though in my mind, um, when there was an issue with what the, um, the high water mark was, there was no restriction on the power boats at the time, uh, for quite some time when we had a high water. The water was about 18 inches into our house before the, there was a, a limit put on the power boats. So we literally had jet skiers roaring past the end of our yard, which was underwater, and the water was 18 inches into our basement at the time. Um, so we had pumps running full steam, trying to empty it. They weren't able to. Um, We've since lined the crawl space, but it's still, you know, now we just have a sump pump that needs to be augmented from time to time. But unfortunately, my house and then um, the ones on either side of me um, suffered the same way. Um, and the water reached the, the foundations of our house, but it was filling us up inside, obviously, as the water table rose. So I'm very interested in how the water flow is regulated and managed into Prior Lake, because obviously that was one of the, the challenges for us was the decisions made to um, regulate that flow into Prior Lake back to the water up into Spring Lake. And as a result, we experienced um, the pretty big flooding. So Christopher, you're, you're the um, third house to the left of the Spring Lake public access. And, um, and to the right, if you're looking at the lake. To, to the right of the public access. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, Christopher, my mom is from Watford. You're not from Watford, are you? No, much further south from there in Cornwall, okay. the southwest. But, uh, right. I know Watford well. <laughs> All right. from the Mike, uh, Christopher, I'd just like to say I like your two areas of interest that you put on your application shoreline restoration and water storage. I think those are two topics we need somebody on the CAC for. So I would certainly welcome you. Thank you, Bruce. Great, thank you. So then I would entertain a motion to accept uh, Christian Crowhurst's um, nomination to the CAC or something like I, that. I make a motion to accept Christopher Crowhurst as a CAC member. Okay. okay. Or Charlie, I think you beat me. Charlie beat you. Charlie's seconding that motion. We're gonna do a roll call. Charlie, how do you vote? Aye. Kurt, how do you vote? Aye. Welcome, Christopher. And Bruce, how do you vote? Aye. I also vote aye. So that passes unanimously. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for joining us uh, both this evening and the CAC. Thank, Thank you very much. Meeting you in Thanks person you someday. Yeah. Thank, Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. All right, Diane, we're moving along. We're on to one of those favorite topics for us is the RUMP, the approval for the 90-day Bowser review. Okay, so uh, you all have seen the latest copy of it. Um, we incorporated the comments that you've had. We incorporated the comments from 
our uh, local governmental units, all of our partners, state agencies, and uh, spent a lot of time on making sure that it would be acceptable to Bowser as well. Maggie and Carl and Carl's team did an excellent job of that and, and uh, staff reread the thing again and made some changes and added some things to it. So we are really confident that we have a product that we can be proud of and would really like your support to move it on to the Board of Water and Soil Resources for their 90 day review. So that's it, right, Diane, on the That's, that's it, yes. Awesome. <laughs> Be the shortest update on the rump <laughs> in, in human history. Um, okay, any any of my colleagues, any questions, comments, thoughts on this one? I think it's ready to move forward. I agree. Nothing, Charlie. Okay, then I would entertain a motion to um to approve the wrmp for the 90-day bowser review so moved second by bruce second by kurt roll call vote charlie how do you vote aye kurt how do you vote aye bruce how do you vote aye mike's an aye too that passes unanimously thank you so the next item then 4.5 we're on to the award of the upper watershed blueprint um, consultant, Diane? Yes, yes. Um, Mr. Chair and managers, on uh, uh, August 16th, we set out uh, an RFP to uh, five firms that were in our consultant pool that a, a subcommittee, which would, was comprised of Bruce Loney and Shirley Howley, felt would have the background and expertise needed to put a, a good RFP together for upper watershed blueprint for us. We uh, whittled, uh, we had three people or three organizations that responded. Uh, the staff recommended two firms for interview. One was RESPEC and the other was WANK and they were both interviewed on May 7th. So the board uh, had a conversation after that meeting about which firm they felt they would like to invite to uh, be our contractor on that project. And I will then turn it over to you, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you, Diane. So I think at this point, I'm just going to uh, would open this up to my colleagues to see if they've got some thoughts to share regarding um, after the interview process. Somebody want to go first? I I think we had a pretty good discussion the last time. And there was some good follow-up. I did review things again the second time, um, but um, I'm still in favor of going with Wink as our consultant. This this is Kurt. I feel the same way. I, I looked things over. I kind of thought about it for several days after that, kind of mulled it over, and I, I'd still like to go with Wink because I, I like the, uh, the the chances of some new, fresh ideas and some new initiatives. So I'm still uh, going to vote for Wink. Okay, Charlie. Yeah, both uh, top uh, quality firms both could do the job, I think. Um, some subtle differences between their approach. Um, I think I I, I supported uh, uh, going with respect, but uh, I certainly think Wink will do a, a fine job, and I'm not um, not gonna you know just. I'll go with uh, what the majority wants, uh, so I'm I'm fine with going with Wank if, if that's where we're headed. Thank you, and I'm going to just share my thoughts too for making of a record. And I thought they both had um, very good uh, proposals to us. I think they both performed well in the interview. Um, clearly, it seems from both them and talking to my colleagues and our our you know engineering consultants here that that they could both do the job technically. Um, personally, I think for me, what really sort of stood out most was on Wenk's side. Um, they were definitely, for me, they were focused on exactly what we are um, attempting to achieve in a quality and a quantity uh, management there, uh, demonstrating a history of results and getting lakes off of the impaired list. 
Um, so it was really sort of results oriented, which which struck me. Um, early on, also, I got convinced that they are coming up with some innovative thinking about what the solutions might be. And they've been successful at securing significant dollars and funding to um, from the state to, to move those projects forward uh, faster um, and a lower cost for us here in the district. So they just stood out to me. I mean, respect and young environmental. I know um, they had some fans voting for them, competent, capable firm, but I too am going with Wink um, for the reasons I stated. So with that, I would entertain a motion from anybody to uh, award our upper watershed blueprint Mike, I'll make a motion to approve the Upper Watershed Blueprint Consultant proposal to Wink, and then I'd like to have a discussion after a second. Sure. Do we have a second? Second that. Second from Kurt. Okay, so further conversation. Go ahead, Bruce. Um, I know they had a proposal of, I, th I think Diane mentioned 75000 and another 2500 um, was an add-on for, yes. I think, early grant application. Yep. Yep. Uh, do yep. we want to put a dollar amount into this? I mean, or not, I guess. Do we, do we need it? Yeah, do we need to put a dollar amount? Because I think well, that's... Point. Let so, me clarify. Sorry, there are little delays here. As I understood that, Bruce, that was for them to pursue funding in this cycle in, in 2020 so not waiting until the blueprint's done to start securing some funding and that they would put some resources to to doing that work correct Is, do i understand that correctly that's the way i understand it i mean that's what we if we're going to authorize or approve the blueprint we should probably put in a dollar amount that we're approving because i don't think that was that was considered an add-on proposal right 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 uh, so you mean, so I think to award the contract and we just did the uh, the budget, we put the dollars in place for this um, in the workshop, but are you saying to um, to fund the additional um, innovative, or I don't remember how they called it, that additional $2,500 though, is that correct? Are you looking yeah. for support for that then, Bruce? Yeah, I guess, I, I guess, you know, I have different thoughts with the way the, the budgeting is going and the state proposals and everything like that is it is it gonna is there gonna be a lot of grant application money available or is there gonna be a slowdown i don't know if it's gonna be something that's needed or you know wait to get the study done and then go after it i guess we could leave it in there with the with the thought that if we, it looks like we don't need to do it or shouldn't do it we could not do it, I guess. You know what, Bruce, I, th I think it's a good idea. And you know what, I'm not sure that we actually need to act on that right now. Um, okay. It would also probably, as we get more clarity in the next couple of months of where we're going, we could we could additionally fund that if need be. But maybe we even hold off until we have a, a the initial meeting and conversation with Wank. Okay, that's fine. I just wanted to bring that up as yep. we're going to authorize a contract with them and that would be an item of discussion i guess no i think it's i think it's a great point bruce i didn't mean it any other way i mean it's a great point i'm glad you brought it up thanks i had forgotten about it so anyone else any further conversation or well i would just add on that normally when we want to approve a, executing a contract with either a consultant for design services or a contractor we set some sort of not to exceed amount, like we have to have a, a number aside with it, and that's where Bruce is going, is um, our motion and what we're approving is either gonna be the base services or the base services plus the add-on. And it doesn't mean you can't add the add-on later, which is what you're yeah. referring to, Mike, which is fine, but we need to at least in our approval of this agenda item have a, an amount. That's fine. So are we going to say the amount then that's in the uh, was in their proposal? That's or do you want to add in the 2500? I guess that's is that Charlie, are you proposing that it may be a friendly amendment to include the up to dollar uh, amount in there? Uh, Mr. Yep. Mr. Chair, I'm looking at the budget right now. 
and it Three. looks to me like the 25 can't hear you you're muffled diane uh hmm can you hear me now yes, yes. okay so it looks to me like the 2500 dollars is already in the 77,500, which was their total estimated budget. If you look at the handout that I've, I've got there on the screen. So they included six phases, not just the five. So it looks to me like that is all in there already. Oh, you're right. It is. Yep, good point, Diane. You know, uh, Mike, this might yes. be real simple. If I amend my motion, to approve the upper watershed blueprint consultant contract to wink in the amount of no, not, 70, to not to exceed 77,500. No. Yep. And then if Kurt, if you're second, okay with that. I'll second that, that uh, amendment to the original motion. Okay, so we have a motion and an amendment uh, to that motion on the floor. Is there any further conversation? Hearing none, we're gonna go to a roll call vote. Uh, Charlie, how do you vote? Aye. Bruce, how do you vote? Aye. Kurt, how do you vote? Aye. Mike votes aye too. Thank you, everybody. All right, the next item on our agenda is 4.6, the liability coverage waiver form. Diane? Diane, we can't hear you at all now. It looks like you're muted. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so we've had some uh, emails going back and forth about people expecting that there were a, there was a memo um, in the packet which would um, explain what it is that we're trying to do here. And um, I was saying, well, this is something we have to do every year. And we've done it six times since I've been here, which by the way, today's my anniversary of six years. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. I made it this far. Oh you're, my God. <laughs> you're, you're stuck with us, Diane. <laughs> uh, but but anyway, so um, I apologize for that. Yes, from now on, we will have it for everything that you're voting on. And so what I did is I went back at, to look at the material that was sent along with the form. And so what we want to do um, is determine what type of liability we want, frankly. And uh, the Minnesota Statutes 466.04 indicates that the statutory tort limits, which means the most an individual could recover from us for one any one claim is $500,000 or a total of $1.5 million for recovery for any single occurrence. So that would be a ver the number of people. If we do waive the statutory tort limits and do not purchase excess liability coverage, a single claimant could get up to $2 million for a single occurrence, which is also the same as the total for recovery for any one single occurrence, no matter how many more people are involved. So our current, our, our current liability is at that $500,000 for any one claim and a total of $1.5 million for any single occurrence. So we're right there. So what we have done in the past, and I'm recommending it again, is that we do not waive the statutory tort limit to ensure that there's a cap. It's a $500,000 per individual and a $1.5 million for any single occurrence. And it protects the district because it follows the maximum liability law and statute and limits the claim amounts. And of course, it will help with the paying of our premiums. So that, that is what I have for you. Thank, thanks, Diane, and thanks sure. for pulling that memo together. Diane, let me, I'm, I'm going to kick this off. Can you please help me understand? So they have this language in here and or force us to do this on an annual basis. And under what circumstance would we ever um, waive those limits? And, and what would the cost be? So I, I don't know what the cost would be to waive the limits. Um, it, we'd have to, it says if a member waives the statutory tort limits, um, they can recover up to that amount of the coverage. Um, and so, you know, they can get more money for it, obviously, uh, if, they, if they wanted to. Um, we would be uh, holding the bag if we, um, if they ended up 
I suppose, suing us for 200,000 or two, 2 million rather. And our maximum was 15 or 1, $1.5 million. Um, so the benefit would be to have the higher coverage if we felt that we were, there was a potential for us to be sued and we'd have to cover the, the balance. Um, you know, but I, I know uh, very little about product liability, but I think what you want to do is limit how much someone can sue you for. And that's one of the beauties that government has the ability to do is limit um, what a person can get as far as um, awards from government. So, um, you know, I don't, like I said, I don't have the premium difference. I don't know of that. I just know that the counsel that we got was just, you know, do not waive it. Just stick with what is required in, in the statute and just leave it at that. Yeah, and I mean, I get it, and I'm not advocating for it, but I'm trying to figure out why the language should even be there that somebody should consider making themselves liable to a higher award and incurring those costs if a government um, entity is not at risk for anything above those minimal, smaller limits. So that's the part that at least I was kind of going, well, what is this? And maybe it's so that's why I was struggling with this myself, Diane. All right. So anyway, anybody else? Yeah, Mike? Yes. I'm the one that kind of raised this issue, but uh, my daughter is an underwriter for the League of Minnesota Insurance Trust, and the extra premium would probably be three and a half or 3.9% higher. But, and Charlie would know this too, this, this insurance covers our group and many cities in Minnesota. So the larger the city, the more exposure, and you probably would want to go to a higher level of protection just because of your circumstances. So that that's that's probably the, the reason and it always comes down to what your legal counsel would recommend in a way. But our exposure is very small in this organization. So there, and I did check last year, we did have it on consent. That's why I didn't recognize it. We never did talk about it last year. So, ah. so anyway. we are at risk. Then you're confirming we are at risk if if there was, yes, the yeah, chance of that. We got to have insurance. It's yeah. the, the cities, I bet you Chan Hass and Charlie might know this. I'm sure they're not, they waive this and they want to go to a higher level for protection, I think. Yeah, I, I got it now. Thanks, yeah. Bruce. It, yeah, but I guess I'm confused now, Bruce, because uh, I'm looking at the statute and there is a maximum liability. Um, you know, and it and the maximum would be fifteen one point five million dollars for any number of claims arising out of a single occurrence for claims arising on or after July first, two thousand nine. Um, so I, you know, I guess I'm still confused then. Uh, about that, but I, I'm I'm impressed that your daughter works for them, and I I appreciate you checking with her on that. Um, and then there there's another thing that says five hundred thousand dollars when the claim is for what for death or by wrongful act or omission, or five hundred thousand to any claimant in any other case for claims arising after July first. So um, yeah, so I I I'm still confused. I guess I'm sorry. Well, if you want, I'll double check it with my daughter, but I'm assuming it is really more of a um, comfort level of your organization. If you have a fairly large city and that doesn't stop lawyers from going after, That's you might have the limits, but they can go after it. Yeah, yep. So uh, as you said, um, Bruce, this is the L L League of Minnesota Cities Insurance trust needs to have this done by May 25th, correct? Correct. My, yeah. yeah, yeah so we, we still don't need to vote on it. Yes. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Mr. Chair, just for what it's worth, in the 25 years I've been working for watersheds, I've not seen somebody wave <laughs> their yep. limits. Okay, thanks, Carl. Anyone want to make a motion? Motion? Yeah, I'll move that we 
check the box to not waive the monetary limits on municipal tort liability. Second. We have a motion and second on the floor, a roll call vote. Um, Charlie, how do you vote? Aye. Bruce, how do you vote? Aye. Kurt, how do you vote? Aye. Mike votes aye too. Thank you, everybody. So the next item is our consent agenda, and that is, uh, as most know, is reserved for the non-controversial items that we vote um, on mass, unless one gets pulled off from by one of my colleagues. So we have our meeting minutes of the April 14th board and workshop, and the special board meeting from 4:24 and 4:30. We have the meeting minutes from the CAC and the claims list. Are there any items that? Or is there an item that somebody wanted to remove from the consent agenda this evening? Mr. President, I'd, I'd like to uh, make an observation on the claims list. Do we do that now or do you have to take it off the consent agenda, I suppose? Huh? Is it just an observation or? Yeah, it's just it's just a comment. Then go for it. Okay. Um, I know it again, WSB has another bill again for over $18,000. And... Um, I uh, just want to make sure that I was promised a full accounting of, of our uh, monies paid to WSB since the 1st of January until the end of June, at the end of June. Is that still the case? So let me clarify, Kurt, what you've asked for before that um, Maggie had agreed to get, Maggie and Diane, that we were going to get an accounting of our expenditures on the accelerated CARP project, right? Uh, Is that what you're referring uh, to? On, a, on any CARP work that WSB has done since Correct. the 1st of January, right? Right, that's okay, yes, that was still agreed to and staff has agreed to, to do that, so. Uh, Mr. That... Mr. Chair, though, can I yep. have a clarification here? Um, Please I do. Thought, I thought we were gonna include more than just WSB, you know, what, what our expenditures have been versus what grant monies we've spent for the work as well. So you have a really clear picture of where the funds are coming from and going to yep perfect diane okay. yes i think okay. it is a, a full a sort of a full accounting of yes. it's actually sort of looking at the project yes you know and it's more i think it's also for posterity and in historical purposes i think it'll be a great to put this as a record what have we spent what's worked what hasn't um what are we trying all that kind of stuff you know and yeah. including the dollars and the budgets because we are the board did step up and put some uh, serious resources in to try and deal with this problem. And I think it's more than appropriate to have a, an accounting just from a project perspective, not just financial. Yes, thank you. Are there any other, is there an item anybody wanted pulled off the consent agenda? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda. By Kurt. Second. Somebody. Charlie. Was there a second? You got it, Bruce. No, did. No, I got it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a motion on the floor to approve the consent agenda. Charlie, how do you vote, sir? Aye. Bruce, how do you vote? Aye. Kurt, how do you vote? Aye. Mike votes aye. Thanks, Jen. So now we're on to the treasurer's report. Charlie, you are on. All right, thank you. Um, let's see. So I sent that out on Saturday. I added a little more detail, reformatted a few things as I continue to do. That continue to learn more, and as new transfers uh, kind of get presented, um, and I had my PDF made, and I was ready to send it out, and I said to myself, you know, we're going to spend our alum reserve, so how can I account that as an expense? So then I quick change it, and I put it in there. And then I sent it off, and that's the one that you guys have. And and Bruce brought it up. He's like, well, are we double counting the Allen Reserve in our yeah. kind of restricted funds versus expenditures? And and I must have thought about this 
four different times since Saturday, and I and I and I always land in a different spot. So just this <laughs> afternoon, I, I I rejiggered my spreadsheet again, thinking about it differently. And I think I've come to the conclusion that what I sent out did double dip the the alum and if everything laid out as shown in that spreadsheet we we would have more in reserves than what it said and, and the amount more would be that alum amount that alum reserve amount so that said um the whole point of my treasury report is to mainly focus on cash flow um it's not to track our budget. That's what Chris's report is for. And um, I added in uh, some things based on, you know, we, you know, we paid the bond off early and, and, and earlier tonight we approved some using of, uh, you know, general fund reserves. Um, all that accounted for about 286,000. Um, and so, I guess the takeaway and what I want to um, impress upon everybody is we're really tight on cash flow. I think at the end of the year, if everything went perfectly, we're going to be in a good position. Um, but we don't know what the property tax payment is going to be. We know we're going to get one and we know we're going to get one on time, but we don't know what it's going to be. And this spreadsheet is accounting for the full amount, essentially, which obviously is the best case scenario, which isn't going to happen. Under normal years, we don't get full payments. We get, you know, 95% of the payment. So that 895,000 up on the top for the first half, I mean, what if 50% of the people only pay? Well, we're only gonna get 50% of our money. And when I was watching the county commissioner's meeting online, they their deal is set up if i'm understanding it correctly is that any large um property tax um property owner of a hundred thousand dollars or more if their bill is that much or more they have until july to pay it they're giving those larger um property owners you know a two-month reprieve i think based on what they're hearing you know from from people, you know, emailing and calling and all related to the COVID stuff, of course. But the normal Joes, um, you know, everybody still do, you know, in a couple of days from now. And um, so they said that and the assessor people or the operations manager, whoever that was, um, is it uh, Cindy, I think is her name? Um, yeah, she's like, right. so you'll get a payment uh, in June uh, then when the new when the the ones that were deferred will get another payment say in August um, and then we'll get our normal payment in December again yeah um, but even the payments we do get is all at the you know it's a, who knows right <laughs> yep um, then you look at what we got out there for FEMA repayment and if you struck struck that 700 grand or or according to the audit it was 600 grand but i think diane you still have to submit another request if i'm not mistaken you know we can't account for any of that this year the way it's going i think fema's primary responsibility is doling out you know covid money too right we're we we got if we weren't at the bottom of the list before we're probably really at the bottom of the list now um so, it, I, you know, we're going to be fine if everything works out, but I, who knows what's hey, going to come in the door, right? Charlie, um, let, let, me, um, let me ask you a question. I don't know if you've thought about this, so I don't mean to pause you, but you've got me thinking, of course, and I think it would be very valuable if we could look out, say, three to six months, um, and do maybe a little bit of a sensitivity analysis on the billing, you know, the um, tax dollars, the levy stuff that's coming in, percentages to, and and look at that to really understand where we're at with some sensitivity analysis on that. Is that 
something you working with Diane and Chris might be able to do for us? Because I think you're bringing yeah, up a very so. worthy subject, but. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think that's prudent to do. Um, yeah. You know, we I did a little cash flow projection when we were, you know, looking at the alum contract. Yeah. And boy, it was tight. But um, we know a little bit more now than we did know then, and um, we'll know a lot more a month from now um, when we see what our first payment is, or at least um, Cindy at the county might be able to give us, uh, you know, yeah, an official a percentage ahead of t ahead of that date. So no, I think that is definitely a worthwhile exercise. Yep. Um, because. Yeah, it's going to be tight, and 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 we we may. I mean, I I don't know what percentage, but I would just say we got a thirty percent chance that we're going to have to go find some money. <laughs> and I don't know if that's through you know issuing bonds or just getting a letter of credit from the bank or whatever. But you know, it, we can't rule it out at this point, and and I don't want to be negative, but yeah, the sky's not falling because again, if everything works out, we're going to be in a fine position. Um, yeah, it's just you've got we've got some cash flow questions. We have some uncertainty. So I tell you what, I mean, Charlie, is this even anything you can do with them in the next couple of weeks so we don't have to wait? Just because I'm, I'm you're raising a great question, and we should we should mm -hmm. have uh, we have a responsibility to probably try and provide a little more understanding of where we might be. Yep, absolutely. Um, it's not anything I could turn around tomorrow, but a couple no. of weeks time should give us right. plenty of time to kind of dig into it a little more. Yeah. I mean, even just, I wouldn't want to wait till the board meeting if you have, a, if we have a chance to, you know, um, take a look at some of those things. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mike. Yeah. Go ahead, Bruce. Charlie's done a great job on this. Yeah. And this spreadsheet is kind of a rosy picture. And were you thinking that if he did like a, I don't know if you call it worst case scenario or give um, us, you know, and well, see where like, Yeah, I think it's more, a little bit more of a sensitivity analysis to get a sense for, and if he talks to Cindy, she can, you know, that's sort of the big uncertainty outside of the FEMA, which is probably even a, a bigger uncertainty. But I mean, that one, we can almost, let's expect that uh, the probability of that coming in is slim at this point for a while. But at least with Cindy could give him some high and low of what's coming in and he could, you know, provide some some worst case scenarios and, you know, typical and high side or something. And then we could look at the major expenditures and look at the contracts that we have. You know, we did structure two of our major uh, alum stuff to, to do this after we get paid. So um, you know what anyway, that's what I I'm thinking of, Bruce. Go ahead. Charlie, Charlie and I talked too a little bit. You know, I don't know when the Sutton Lake grant comes in or contract, but is it might be possible we delay it till next year or something or whatever. But those are all things that, as we move forward, we just keep in mind. You know, right? We have, we have a lot of moving parts here, but Charlie brought that up to me too. That's a possibility. But we'll see. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's the point. You know, we don't know what. That's out in the fall, so I think it's uh, getting the next six months would be ideal. That should get us through some of these initial tax stuff. Um, well, I mean, heck, it's almost to you know November, so I would think that'd give us a lot of clarity to be able to make the decisions on what we do or not do with respect to, you know, Sutton Lake or a whole bunch of other stuff, Bruce. I mean, yeah, no, this is good. This is a good snapshot of today and yeah. uh, we'll have to see i mean the one i'm really more concerned about i'm not concerned about the property tag we're gonna get something but that's yeah. team thing that's a big big dollar amount and those people and, have a tendency to drag their feet so um mr chair could i make a comment yeah. about that please, so, please do yeah so i'm sitting here thinking and um you know if we decided to go to the bank and get some type of a a of loan or to bond based upon the fact that we are gonna get that fund, that money, certainly we'll get whatever it is they promised on the worksheets. Um, the additional funds would be the question if they would be willing to pay the extra money that we've asked for, for you know, specifically for the sediment delta project. But we could, I would, I would just offer 
that we've got some accounts receivable coming in that are pretty big. And so that would be somewhat of a guarantee to whatever lending agency we would use to help um, upfront that cash. Yeah. So I always sort of hate um, playing the doing mental gymnastics when we don't really have a sense for uh, the like that's why I'm asking for Charlie to guess a picture. I know there's a bunch of stuff we could do, but if we could get some better idea of what it is we need to manage through, then we can have those conversations. I just don't I I think they're mental gymnastics now. So that's oh, why I'd like to see it. Oh, I totally agree with you. I just was adding oh. that because it popped into my mind that we'd, yeah. be, we'd be pretty good credit risks on that one. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I don't even know if we need to pull the trigger. So oh, let's, no, no. You're right. Let's okay. let's you know, just keep the meeting moving. So sure. Yep. Um Anyone else? Any other questions for Charlie? Seeing none again, Charlie. Thank you for uh, you know continuing to improve our our understanding. It's much appreciated, sir. We'll get there eventually, and then and then I'll I won't be there. So yeah. Know. Well, you're going to hand it over to Bruce. <laughs> Actually, we should work on a transition. So, Bruce, I know you're already talking to him. So, yeah, and no, I know you have uh, your eye. Oh, that's eye great. On. That's great to hear. It's only taken Charlie five years to get to this point. I wonder how long it'll take me. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that five years, I've only done it. This is my second year. Remember? Yes, Woody I was going to say, let's be fair. <laughs> but it, but it, yeah. it's, been a, it's been a process to figure yeah. this all which is well, great. And and so it'll just be booted up to you, Bruce. You'll just yeah. be able oh. to fill in the blanks. Yep. No, once I get a, I have a nice accountant at home here too that can help me too. That's right, you do. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So we're on to manager presentations that are related to watershed activities. Anybody? Mike, I had I had one more question just in the previous, real quick, is, uh, can we have the administrator document any efforts and any uh, dialogue she has with FEMA trying to get that money? Because it's a big deal. Can you raise yeah. that, please? Thank Diane, you. any comments? Just because I'm sure you'd, that can you, something you can help us understand where they're at or try again? Oh, sure. Um, what your uh, manager had is just make sure I understand your uh, request. So you're asking me to just let you know when I'm uh, knocking on FEMA's door to let you know what, what I'm hearing back from them, et cetera? Uh, if, uh, if you could do that, you know, any dialogue, any replies you're getting, you know, sure. maybe we can do something, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of money and, and, and uh, both that and the uh, June uh, tax levy num numbers are, right. uh, adds up almost to a million and a half dollars. Thank you. Yep, sure. Yeah. Yep, that's a good point, Kurt and Diane, yeah, please, Please go after him, see if you can get us paid and let us know where you're at. That'd be awesome. Good good thought, Kurt. Um, anybody have any updates on anything, even though we're not going to meetings? The, any further? The only thing I have, Mike, is uh, Sand Creek Township has not afforded me uh, uh, electronic access to the meetings. So I've simply been sending in a few items like the status of the uh, Allen treatment on Spring Lake. And uh, by the way, um, I've been trying to get out there every couple, three days, and uh, I talked to them today, and they're estimating what decent weather, which the forecast looks like, that they'll be done either Thursday or Friday. And all is going well. They've got plenty of uh, raw material now. They had been playing catch up over the weekend, but it looks like uh, it's full steam ahead to the finish line. Awesome. Anybody else? Uh, Mike, and I just, you know, the Scott County WMO, I mean, their meeting is, I, I, it was pretty boring and pretty nonchalant, but I was just wondering, have we had any more conversation about a joint meeting? Has that been on hold? Yeah, I think. Yeah, it's on uh, hold. I mean, Diane, go for it. I think we're on hold. Yeah, we're on hold. You know, they, they're not interviewing prospective managers. We're on hold for. The, the WMO conversation. So, uh, you know, it's kind of dropped down to the bottom of the list, I'm sure. Yeah, 
they've got bigger fish to fry, I think, right now. But I did also ask an interview candidate if they've heard anything and they have not. Okay, thanks. Yep. Charlie, anything from you, sir? Nope. All right, I've got nothing. So let's, uh, our upcoming meetings, next item, we have a cooperators meeting this Thursday from 12 to 1.30. And we have a CAC meeting on May 28th, 6.30 to 8 p.m. So then the most exciting motion always in one of these meetings is, an, is a motion to adjourn. Do we have a, such a motion? Motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. Do we have a motion on the floor to adjourn? Um, roll call vote. Charlie, how do you vote, sir? Aye. Bruce, how do you vote? Aye. And Mike votes aye too. Or sorry, Kurt. God, aye. I did that again. Sorry, Kurt. It's twice <laughs> I was. <laughs> and Mike votes aye as well. So this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, um, Diane, Maggie, Jamie, Carl. And, Catherine. Um, Catherine. Yeah. 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 yeah, she's not on here anymore. I looked. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank all. you. All right. Yeah, but thank thanks you. Thanks, everybody. You bet. Have a good night. Everybody. All right. Yeah. Enjoy this beautiful evening. Yeah. Bye. You too. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.